All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order for the July 19th um, meeting for the Cannabis Advisory Committee for Bureau of Cannabis Control. Let's start with the uh, roll call, please. Baboyan? Cermak? Here. Clifford? Here. Dombrowski? Farrow? Present. Heidelback Terramoto? Here. Harada? Here. Huffman? Jacobson? Leff? Here. Lynch? Here. Nevidal? Here. Nikita? Here. Peck? Here. Ron? Here. Stevenson? Sweeney? Here. Todd? Here. Williams? Here. Woolsey? Here. Wu? Here. You? Here. Quorum is established. Okay, just a couple quick housekeeping items for our... Uh, for our members, the uh, communication system we have today is a little different. It's the right button in front of you, and you have to hold it down to get it to work. So just remember that. Uh, we have uh, opening remarks this morning by uh, Ms. Lori Ajax, Chief of the Bureau. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Man. <laughs> Welcome to San Diego. It's great to be here, along with all the Comic-Con people. So, uh, so I don't know that we knew that when we scheduled this meeting down in San Diego. But once again, thank you, everybody, for being here. It just really shows your commitment to the process and your passion uh, for what we're doing here. And thank you, committee members, for being here again and your time and commitment. Uh, I think I'm just going to give a, we have some great uh, informational panels today that we're looking forward to hearing from, and um, I just wanted to let everybody know, most of you know, that we released our proposed regulations last Friday, all three licensing authorities, including Public Health, Food and Ag, and the Bureau. Uh, we will be having public regulation hearings where you can, it will be devoted to just hearing public comment. All three of our agencies are going to have these public hearings. They're going to happen all over the state for the next, uh, until uh, the public comment period for 45 days, so it'll end on August 27th. So we have that all on the cannabis.ca.gov website, and you can see for both Food and Ag, Public Health, and the Bureau, all of our public hearings. We also have materials on the table that shows you how to get involved in the process. If you can't come to one of our regulations hearings, there's other ways that you can get public comment to us, and we would just really encourage everybody here to please utilize that process. So welcome, and really look forward to a very productive meeting today. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for that. Uh, and again, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us here in beautiful San Diego. Um, let's go ahead and start with uh, the review and approval of the uh, minutes from the May uh, 17th uh, Advisory Committee. Uh, looking for a motion and a second. Motion to approve. All right, we have a motion by Ms. Peck and a uh, second by uh, Mr. Sweeney. Any, uh, any discussion by the members? Only discussion is Mr. Sweeney wasn't here for the meeting, so I'd suggest that somebody who was here for the entire duration be the second. Uh, we usually typically don't have to worry about that as long as the member has reviewed the, the meeting okay. minutes. Yeah. But thank you. All right. We'll keep it with Mr. Sweeney then. All right. Any other comments or discussion from the members? I have one point that... Um, it would re be really very useful for anyone looking at these minutes at some point in the future to have it either an addendum of specifically what the recommendations were that were referred to only by number in the minutes, uh, either an addendum of what those recommendations are so they know why we were having the discussion we were ha having, or maybe even put those recommendations in the minutes. It, it, Either way, it would uh, really clarify and make the minutes more valuable. Okay. Yeah, so noted. Thank you. Any others? I just want to agree with that statement because while we're reading the minutes, it says recommend, recommendation one, and <coughs> unless you know what that is, uh, the minutes are not very useful. Okay. Any others? All right, seeing none, we will go ahead and uh, move to uh, public comment. And we have a uh, new facilitator joining us here this morning. Hi, everyone. Um, just a few quick 
Uh, before we start with uh, the public comment, restrooms are right out this door for the men on this floor. Women's go up to the second floor, and it'll be um, a quick right and then a right in the hallway. Um, there's also restrooms through the restaurant, um, straight through, and then also to the right. Um, parking validation, we will have the hookahs <coughs> parking validation. There is a staff um, as sitting at the cocktail table as you had entered. Um, he is there to um, validate self-parking as well as valet parking. Uh, lastly, uh, there is a restaurant here for lunch available, but there will also be a food truck. Um, if you go right out these doors to the left, um, to the outside area, there will be a food truck there. Moving on to the public comment process, just so we're all aware, um, we'll have everybody line up. Uh, on this right aisle, um, and as soon as there's a chair available, please sit down. We'll have um, moved from speaker one, two, and three. Everybody will have two minutes. Um, there'll be a green light when your time has started, yellow light at 30 seconds, and then a red light with a soft beeping to let you know your time is over. Um, please remember that it's public comment, so um, change your, or turn your questions into a comment. Um, and then um, lastly, please speak clearly into the microphone for our court reporter as well as note takers. Um, with that, I'd like to start off public comments with speaker number one. Thank you, good morning, Susan Tibben. The minutes moved for adoption need clarification. The subcommittee for microbusiness entertained numerous presentations from important coalitions, equity, veterans, and compassion. As a result, not as much as expected was accomplished at the subcommittee meetings. The Los Angeles CAC meeting in March allowed no time for microbusiness review. An April meeting was proposed, none occurred. The Oakland CAC meeting in May saw much confusion as to what exactly a microbusiness is. The vote on security by local jurisdictions had some people feeling that microbusiness is for the small farmer. Others saw it as a vertical integration tool since the cap was 4.5 million. And what happens after that? Page 29 and 30 of the minutes say that the motion failed, 8 to 6. But looking at the votes, they were 8 ayes and 6 nays. The very next day, the Bureau issued their readoption of emergency regs with even more stringent security measures. Were these minutes looked at by the Bureau? Today, microbusiness is not on the agenda, even though it was to be continued. It turns out the Bureau didn't know what the prefix micro meant either and granted unlimited manufacturing, distribution, and retail, and called it a microbusiness. This interpretation is quite a stretch. As stated earlier, the apparent approval of local security measures should have been sent to the Bureau as approved. However, it seems it was already decided. The small farmer has always worked out of their home. The need for local jurisdiction to have the authority to determine appropriate security measures is simply common sense. The northern counties and small communities across the state are experiencing a financial and social disaster. The complete locking out of the small legacy farmer who must continue home business to survive is a disaster we can avoid by immediately crafting special home business license for the families who were relying on the micro business as a way to enter the market. Thank you. Speaker number two. Um, Susan's pretty much summed it up. The, the discrepancy in the minutes uh, with the vote um, that it was that it did pass. This was a, a agenda item number or um, resolution number one, which dealt with local security, having the local jurisdiction be responsible for uh, the security measures, rather than having a one size fits all for the entire state. Um, the uh, Micro business we had hoped was going to be a uh, an agendized item after the letter of clarification. That's what it was stated at the last uh, CAC meeting. Uh, it wasn't agendized. Apparently, it was given to big business because there's unlimited uh, manufacturing, distribution, and retail. You could have have a Costco building with your bars. Uh, does everyone have a copy of this? I sent it. It's in your packet. I have copies for everyone here. Uh, so that they can take a look at it. This is what we propose as a home business. The fact that in the, in the emergency readoption, 
they, they, they added as an amendment that you couldn't have a cannabis operation out of your private residence. Where do you think the people in Mendocino County have been operating all these years? Out of gas stations? Um, it, it's just untenable. I mean, it, it, it's a home business. There are recommendations. This is the first draft, and I'm willing gonna, to work with... I don't, I don't mean to interrupt. But we're just going to remind you there's an opportunity for the public comment, but this is just on the minute meeting. Uh, meeting minutes for the last uh, I understand but it's because it was intended in the minutes it was intended to be on the agenda and so that's why I'm talking about the agenda item at this and that this is the micro business piece uh, is a recommendation and I'm willing to work with the bureau and anybody in, in fine-tuning this so that this license can be developed thank you very much okay moving on we have uh, two uh, informational Sorry, yeah, uh, we need to vote on this. Uh, so we have a motion uh, by Ms. Peck, uh, second by Mr. Sweeney. Uh, let's do a roll call vote uh, for. For clarification purposes, uh, I was a micro uh, business chair, and uh, I was sick, so I was not at the last meeting. I did go over these notes. Uh, I, I did give a, uh, a second, but I would just hope that um, if there is a reversal, uh, because if we did get it wrong, we want to correct it in the minutes. Um, so I, I, I don't know if we, if we got it wrong, I wasn't there. Yeah, they're, they're going to look into this and provide some clarification, but my understanding is it's a nuance in the way the motion was made versus how the vote was cast. So, uh, Ms. Peck, um, if you'd like to maybe amend your motion, I'll make, make a recommendation as amend the motion basically to... Uh, um, allow staff to uh, report back to us on this, approve the minutes as, uh, as uh, written, but with, the, uh, with an amendment that uh, allows us to uh, update those minutes if an error has been made in the uh, minutes. Or we could also table. I make a motion to table the minutes until staff reviews with, with you. Fair enough. Sorry, you're, you're withdrawing your motion then? I'm withdrawing my motion, yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yeah, that, I think that'll satisfy. <coughs> okay. Then that motion just uh, dies right here. All right, moving on. Uh, we have a uh, informational presentation. So as you recall, uh, we had a, a list of uh, items that as the board, uh, we uh, uh, sort of uh, set priority to. And so we've invited a couple of folks here today to uh, help us. Uh, the first one we're, we're having is on uh, cannabis enforcement from local government perspective. And joining us is uh, Mr. Joe Devlin, Chief of Cannabis Policy and Enforcement for the City of San Diego, uh, Sacramento. And uh, Jonathan Feldman, Legislative Advocate, California Police Chiefs Association. Good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us today. Good morning. Hey, yeah, thanks for having us. This thing on. I'm Jonathan Feldman. I'm the legislative advocate for the California Police Chiefs Association. Uh, do I have two minutes? Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> right. no like, you're good to go. I'm going to really have to go fast through this. <laughs> okay. Uh, so California Police Chiefs Association, just who we are, we represent every police chief in the state. There's 332 of them. Uh, they, don't they don't cover the entire state. There are a few small agencies that contract out with sheriff's departments or other larger police departments. But municipal police departments and the chiefs are responsible for public safety, frontline law enforcement services for about 80% of the population. So we are the, the cops you see on the street, that's, that's uh, who the chiefs are, are uh, in charge of. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to come today and talk about enforcement and what's going on in, in the cannabis realm. But before I do that, I kind of want to give a brief overview of, of general enforcement issues facing law enforcement, because it's important to have that context when we also start talking about marijuana enforcement, because nothing happens in a bubble, and law enforcement's resources are stretched thin right now on a number of different issues. So I want to just highlight those real quick. Um, you have to oblige me. It's a bit of my soapbox moment. 
Uh, so most apartments' budgets have never fully recovered from the 2008 financial collapse. Um, and although some departments are finally being allotted for more staffing levels, they're not finding candidates. Recruitment for law enforcement is incredibly difficult right now. And there's a number of reasons for that. The demands on law enforcement are going up. Uh, the, the scrutiny on law enforcement's at an all-time high, and you're just having trouble finding qualified candidates. So it's not uncommon for me to talk to a chief who has maybe slotted 110 uh, sworn officers, but they can only fill 90 positions. I mean, most chiefs I talk to are operating somewhere between 10 and 20 percent below their approved staffing levels. So uh, more, uh, more demands, uh, more uh, demands on the quality of law enforcement that we are providing, um, and it's tougher to find uh, candidates. So with limited resources and those, uh, sorry about that, limited resources and, and those demands going up, you know, we're also dealing with other issues, violent crimes on the rise, property crimes on the rise, uh, mental health issues in every community, substance abuse, homelessness, ongoing state mandates. Uh, you look at the criminal justice reform system as a whole, it's had major shifts in the last five years. Prop 47, AB 109, prison realignment, Prop 57. These are massive shifts in our criminal justice system. And I won't, you know, we don't have to debate whether they were good or bad, and there's, there's arguments on both sides. But we can all agree those were massive shifts that have law enforcement has had to absorb. And then on top of that, we have Prop 64 that's also um, had consequences. Good and bad, you know, there, there have been consequences, and there are things that law enforcement has had to take on on top of all those other issues that I just mentioned. Um, you know, the cannabis market is projected to be close to $5 billion. So you took a $5 billion industry and you basically threw it on local governments and said, here, we need you to regulate this, uh, ensure that it's compliant, and, and also go after the illegal operators to make sure that the legal market can stand up, that there aren't people undercutting the folks that are trying to do it lawfully. And so that has been another tremendous burden placed on law enforcement. It's a pretty new one. I mean, the, law enforcement is good about going after uh, narcotics traffickers, uh, but kind of being part of this regulatory system is something that's a little bit new, and especially because it's a brand new regulatory system. I mean, we're six months, seven months into this entire new world, and uh, no one's really figured it out quite yet. Um, and, uh, you know, law enforcement is the ones who, who get called lots of the time. I mean, if it's a home invasion because someone jumped a fence trying to break into someone's grow house in their backyard, if it's, uh, you know, nuisance issues with the smell of a certain business that's too close to a, a nosy neighbor. Uh, you know, those are issues that law enforcement gets called to. I know that we have to kind of take some time to figure out who's responsible for what at the state end and the local end and figure out who's um, taking charge on these different issues. But we're the ones that get called a lot of the time. I don't think that, the, you know, a, a neighbor is going to call the bureau and say, hey, you know, I have this issue or that issue. They're going to call their local law enforcement. We're going to have to be able to respond. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly go over the kind of issues that we're seeing, and they break into two basic categories. There's the legal market and there's the illicit market, um, and both have different kind of issues uh, related to each. There's, there's some overlap, and some, um, but I'll just kind of break it that, down that way because I think it's easy to kind of follow through. So with home grows, you know, you've got the legal home grows and, and making sure that those are compliant, that they're not... Uh, contaminating neighborhoods. Um, also with the legal home grows, I mean, unfortunately, I have had a few examples. And, and before I came today, I called each one of our region reps um, for the state. We've got 15 police chiefs that make up uh, our board of directors, and each one is responsible for a certain region in the state, and there are conduits. Um, if I need information from a certain region, I'll call one of those chiefs. So I called each one of them before coming today to just get a sense of what they're seeing and um, what issues have been presented. And Unfortunately, a lot of them talked about home invasions. Uh, you know, folks realizing that there's cannabis inside one of these homes that someone's growing. And uh, in Santa Rosa area, some kids jumped a back fence and stabbed a neighbor uh, to break into their house to steal what they had. Um, in Sonoma County, there was another example where it was uh, another home invasion. And uh, they got the wrong address, so they just walked into a house of a family and, and 
uh, assaulted the family and ran out because they realized there was nothing there for them. And I'm not trying to use this as a scare tactic. I'm just saying it's happening. Um, I can't quantify how uh, the extent of it, but it's you know enough examples, enough anecdotal examples to me that it's, uh, it's something I felt worth bringing up today. Um, illegal home grows. I mean, I think Joe could probably talk. Uh, more about that because Sacramento has done a great job of cracking down on folks that have been abusing that system. But that's just a ton of work. I mean, to know who's uh, growing, are they growing within the limits, are they uh, siphoning off electricity, is there any other problems, health problems in the house. Um, you know, I've been talking a lot to the chiefs about making sure that you have a local ordinance in place that requires at least, at the very least, reporting of what you're growing. Um, and if you're growing, if not a license and other, other type of information so that we know who's, who's growing lawfully in their house and who's not because there are a lot of illegal grows that are setting up shop. Uh, um, Chinese cartels are buying track homes, gutting them, uh, growing pounds and pounds and shipping it off across state borders or overseas. Um, and so those are, those are big issues. Uh, we talk about Enforcing the legal market, you know, keeping compliance, inspections, monitoring. Uh, I know there's th that role is going to be split between the state and the locals, but really to do it effectively, I think the locals have to be involved in that. Um, they just, they're the boots on the grounds, you know, they're, they're the manpower. You know, we've got thousands of officers in each region and there aren't thousands of BCC staff yet. Um, or I don't know if there ever will be that many enough to cover the entire state. It's really going to take a partnership between the two. Um, code enforcement as well to make sure that, you know, uh, all the things that they need to check for are secured. Law enforcement is not, I mean, we're not code enforcement officers. We're not going to be able to tell if there's an OSHA violation or electricity is being pulled in a, in a um, dangerous way. Um, and then the, sh the, the transporting a product on the legal market, I mean, we'll be excited when the track and trace system is finally up and running and it's electronic and everything's done uh, where we can sort through that information quickly. I flew out to Colorado about six months ago to look at their track and trace system and it was, it was awesome to see, you know, you can log in on a, uh, any, any law enforcement officer can log into their website and check the movement of product. Uh, you know, they've got investigators that know exactly what numbers to look for, look for discrepancies. That's where you can spot the diversion and inversion and it's, it's uh, you know, they've got it down there, but it took them a long time to set that system up. And it's going to take a long time for us to get all of this set up and um, running smoothly. Uh, and then when we talk about the black market, you know, you've got the individual dealers, the guys that are just uh, been selling cannabis for a long time and they've got their network and they're still doing it. The problem with that is that they know the penalties are so low that they're, they're not scared or intimidated by our narcotics detectives. I mean, I've talked to a few detectives that had arrested the same guy a couple dozen times, and he's just, okay, give me my ticket. You know, I'll, I'll pay it. But I, this is what I've been doing. I don't have any other skills. This is how I make my living, and I'm going to just keep doing it. Um, you know, there's, there's the ability to, you know, stack penalties, and there are ways that we can go after some of the more chronic abusers of the system, but uh, that takes a lot of time and effort, partnering with the DAs to make sure that they've got enough information to charge them effectively. Um, so, and then, then on the low level guys, I think the state, the voters, the people, even city councils have signified that, that these low level marijuana crimes, they don't want enforced as aggressively as they once maybe have been. You know, or, for example, Oakland's ordinance specifically tells their law enforcement that marijuana violations will be the lowest priority for the department. So that's a clear signal to the police, hey, this is not our priority. Don't bring us a bunch of cases. Um, you know, spend your time and your efforts more effectively. Again, with all the other things we're dealing with, mental health, violent crime, homelessness, substance abuse. Um, so, uh, you know, and the DA, I mean, I, a DA is going to be very reluctant to just prosecute a misdemeanor marijuana case too. I mean, just to be honest with everybody. That's, that's uh, for the same reasons. The state has deprioritized that. They want their focus elsewhere. There are other bigger priorities. Uh, if law enforcement you know, kept bringing them misdemeanor possession case after possession case, they're just going to get turned away for the most part. Um, 
So the focus then has to be at the larger, more sophisticated operations. Uh, what we've seen there is retail fronts, the illegal retail fronts are, are starting to go away and these um, illegal systems are, are shifting towards a delivery model. One, it's harder for us to track them down. It's more fluid. Uh, you know, you don't have a static location that law enforcement can stake out. Uh, you know, they just took down one in Sac County where it was almost, I mean, it was like a, a real business structure. They had, you know, a pyramid uh, system at the top and drivers down below. And to take it down, I mean, you, they started picking off the drivers at the very bottom of the pyramid, but that wasn't getting them anywhere because they would just re, uh, replace them as soon as, you know, one got pulled off the street. And it took a while to build the case and, you know, find the person at the very top who was running the operation. They did, um, but that took a lot of effort, a lot of time, uh, required partnerships with uh, DOJ, uh, Franchise Tax Board, and BOE because we've got to look at some of the financial crimes now. These aren't just drug crimes. The drug crimes honestly usually don't stick. It's the financial crimes that, uh, that usually are what takes these folks down. Um, so, uh, and then also with the large scale operations, um, I, I spoke to the, the Central Sierra Chiefs and I expected to hear about a lot about cultivation, illegal cultivation out in those rural territories and they actually said they haven't been seen as much. Um, you know, again, it's early so we can't really quantify anything right now. Uh, but it's, you know, they talked more about heroin, methamphetamines, PCP. I mean, those are the drugs that they're seeing more and more in the more rural parts of the state. Uh, the cultivation has actually grown, gone down uh, anecdotally, again. You know, I hate using anecdotal examples, but it's kind of early in the system, uh, process. So that's all I really have right now. Uh, one of the narcotics detectives that I talked to thought that it was because the environmental penalties are still significant. I mean, those are where the felonies are. So, you know, if, you, if you're diverting water, if you've got chemicals near a water source or a watershed, I mean, those are felonies still. And it could be that, you know, folks are realizing that the penalties uh, that you could run into for cultivating outdoors are higher than the ones you could for indoors. So maybe there's a shift towards these indoor grows. Um, and then, of course, diversion is a huge issue. You know, the numbers always get thrown around. We grow five to eight times as much cannabis as we consume. Where is the rest going? I mean, it's being shipped to the other states, East Coast. You can make, you know, um, three, four times as much money as you could out here selling it. Uh, so trying to track that down, that requires partnerships with our federal law enforcement partners. Um, and it's, again, that, that's time consuming and, and takes a lot of staff work. Um, again, so I, I did talk to a few chiefs that have gone through the process to shut down an illegal retail front. Um, you know, developing probable cause in that case, stakeouts, you've got to go in and do buys, and these aren't stores that operate typical nine to five hours. You've got to, you know, know when they're there. Um, be trusted enough to be let in the front door, make the buy, build the case, work with the DA to make sure that the DA is going to charge it. Um, one, one retail front that was taken down in Ventura it took six weeks for them to do all that and to build the case and effectively take them down with enough on the individual to make sure that the DA was going to fall through and charge them. Um, you know, it's... And a lot of this is, it's not just law enforcement that can do it on their own. We've got to work with utility companies, look for electricity theft. In LA, that's, that's been effective because you can get grand theft charges on someone if they're siphoning electricity illegally. Um, again, the BOE and Franchise Tax Board, because you can look at the financial crimes, real estate fraud, and code enforcement. I mean, it, it takes a collaborative effort to really go down and shut these folks down. It's not just law enforcement on their own that can do it. Um, so those are the issues that we're facing. What chiefs are doing right now, uh, most local governments are still working to pass their ordinances. A lot of them are going to re require uh, ballot votes of their, of their um, city population to make sure that the tax structure is, is approved. And um, I, I think a lot of governments also want to make sure that the, wherever they go in this space, they know that the locals have, the, their local constituents are okay with it. So a lot of them are putting them on ballot measures. Um, 
in larger cities like Sacramento and San Jose and in LA, there's, they actually have specific enforcement, division, enforcement divisions that are being set up. Um, but not every city is going to have those kind of resources. A lot of them are going to rely on county task force to kind of take on some of this work. But again, the task force are usually focused more on methamphetamine, heroin, PCP, which has gone up tremendously in the last three to four years. I remember looking at numbers from LA Impact, which is the largest task force in the state, and I, it might be in the nation, um, covers most of the LA region. Uh, seizures for methamphetamines, PCP and heroin have doubled or tripled in the last four years. Um, so that's, and that's gonna take priority for a department. So moving forward, what, what departments need? I mean, it's clear to us, resources. They need to make sure that you know they've they've got the staffing levels and and um, the capability to effectively enforce against some of the stuff. And a lot of that's going to come from the local taxes that are derived from licensing and regulating this product. Uh, but we've also seen certain areas that even when they do, it's not enough. So I know that there'll be some grants coming from uh, the state for enforcement purposes, but it remains to be seen how much and how effective that's going to be getting out statewide. Those grants are also only available if you license retail and cultivation and or cultivation. So if you don't, if you just a city that licenses lab testing or delivery, um, you're not going to be eligible for those, those grants. And that's going to be limiting to the effect that that has statewide. Uh, we also need to make sure that the partnership, I know we talked about this between the state and the local governments are as robust as it possibly can be, sharing of information, um, that we have contacts in each region. Um, you know, if, if the, the state is investigating one operation in one region, make sure that local law enforcement knows that, can help out with their information um, and their resources. Uh, I'd also hope that, the, the like I said, uh, a lot of this information that I'm providing is anecdotal because we don't have the statistics and that's something that we should be tracking statewide. I don't really know what's being done. Uh, I know there are different agencies are individually collecting information, but we've done that in different, on different issues and it's, it's difficult because each department will collect it slightly different and comparing it statewide and trying to compile it is not gonna be as effective as if the state just said, okay, this is the data that we need from each department um, we need to be uniform so that we can, we can really look at the whole picture and see what we're dealing with. Um, you know, one of the chiefs that I talked to from Grass Valley uh, brought up uh, the, the educational penal program for youth who are arrested with possession to make sure, like, what effect is that having? Because he's had a few minors that, he've, that he, they've put through that educational program that have recidivated, that they've picked up again for possession charges. So making sure that we know, is this program really working? Is it, uh, is it having an effect? Is it enough to make sure that, you know, folks are getting the message that this is a dangerous product for anyone under the age? Um, that would be helpful. You know, clear direction too. I think I've sat in a few, two or three meetings uh, with the administration kind of talking about who's responsible for what and really it's not entirely clear yet. A lot of finger pointing, well, that's your job. Well, no, that's your job. And, well, we don't have the money to do it. We'll need it. We, so just make sure that we know exactly who's responsible for what. Uh, law enforcement would love some training on track and trace, on uh, deliveries, on, on anything that would be helpful to make sure that we're being as effective as possible. Because again, with limited resources, we've got to make sure we're not wasting them um, and using them effectively. And then lastly, I mean, time. It's going to take time for this to get set up appropriately um, and with enough uh, assurance that we know what we're doing. It's going to, you know, it's a learning curve. I think we're all experiencing it in our own different ways. And law enforcement's going to be no different. City governments are going to be no different. Uh, and we'll be patient as we work through it, but just make sure that we're progressing uh, in each step and not wasting time or uh, going backwards. So that's it for me. Happy to answer questions when you guys have them. All right. Well, let's go ahead and, uh, unless you guys have any real burning questions, uh, let's go ahead and uh, have Mr. Devlin uh, give his presentation. Thanks for joining us this morning. Mr. Chairman, 
I have a burning question. Go ahead. What um, his comments and his presentation is that going to be his full text on on the website, or how are we? Do, are, do you have that in a report that can come to the committee? I have my notes that I typed up, but they're legible to probably just me. <laughs> but I, I will I will make them more formal if you'd like. I can put up bullet points of what I said. We'll, we'll make sure we include. The, yeah, uh, I can I can provide that notes for you in a minute. Thank Mr. You, Chairman, I, I have a question. <clears throat> the question essentially is, what do you think would be necessary to reframe this idea of a low-level marijuana crime? The reason I ask this is that that concept is um, a concept that comes from the anti-drug war perspective. And I think many of us would have agreed that we wanted to uh, uh, minimize or eliminate the the often unjust penalties uh, during that time. But um, this is hardly a low-level marijuana crime. This is a tax evasion crime. This is a crime which, if there's enough tax that's evaded, it should clearly be a felony. And the problem with this is that it is taking money away from uh, the environmental rehabilitation, from law enforcement, and most importantly, from my standpoint, from the, the youth uh, fund for uh, prevention, education, early intervention, and treatment of youth who do become uh, harmfully involved with marijuana. So we need to find a way, and I'm wondering what you think would be necessary to move beyond this being seen as a low-level marijuana crime. After all, there are no low-level alcohol crimes of people who brew alcohol, sell it out of the, the trunk of their car. There's a big enough industry, I suspect, that's going to make damn sure that that gets, that yeah. gets uh, enforced against. So what do you think is necessary at this point to move to a reframe? I mean, I, I agree. It, it does need to be reframed. Um, and we're, we're, what we talk about is these aren't drug crimes anymore. These are financial crimes. Uh, we're not trying to reinstate the war on drugs. We're not trying to, you know, target the true lowest level offenders. But there are folks that are going to take advantage of the system, um, and they are. And I'll, I'll juxtapose this with property crime issues that we're seeing in uh, the wake of Prop 47, which basically lowered uh, any theft under $950 to a misdemeanor. Uh, there are folks that realize now they can go again and again and again and keep stealing, and they're always going to get a misdemeanor. There used to be a penal code section. Um, Penal Code Section 666, Petty Theft with a Prior, that if you had a certain number of petty thefts, at some point it would kick over and be a wobbler. A judge could charge you with a felony if they decided that it had, it had gone to that, that state. And that way we could target the repeat offenders. You know, not the, not the first time, not the kid that stole a magazine or something like that, but someone who was clearly abusing the system. And we lost that with Prop 47. Um, you know, maybe a penalty like that on a repeat offender, this is your fifth time, give the judge the option to charge you as a misdemeanor or a felony at that point. Uh, you know, on the financial crime, trying to charge that as a financial crime, you're going to have to have someone other than just law enforcement there. You're probably going to have to have someone from the Franchise Tax Board or IRS or something like that. And they're not going to probably spend a bunch of resources for these, these just low-level street dealers. Um, you know, the, when they've gotten involved, it's been on the much bigger, large-scale operations. So something like that could be effective because, again, at this point, um, you can get picked up again and again. And, and there, I, I will say there are options for folks to charge, stack these misdemeanors and charge you, you know, consecutively. Um, but you've got to, I mean, in order to make sure that that happens, everything has to line up. You've got to have a partnership with your your prosecutors and your local law enforcement, the timing's got to make sense, and you can't get lost in translation as you're shuffling through, you know, all these different cases. That's just tough to do. It's, I, th I would point out that these are not just financial crimes, but these are also undercutting the legitimate industry. Yeah. And these are, I don't know if you call them crimes, but it's clearly making the legitimate industry suffer in a way that uh, slows down its ability to um, dominate the market the way we eventually want it to. Yeah. yeah. And I will say, you know, from all the folks in the legitimate industry, uh, you know, I, I saw someone posted on Instagram, I think it was a billboard from Kentucky or something, but the sheriffs had actually taken it out there and it said, hey, drug dealers, you know, uh, 
do yourself a favor. Tell us where your competition is. You know, let us let us know. We'll, we'll you know, <laughs> we'll help you out. And it was a joke, but it, you know, I talked to the folks in the industry. It's like if there are folks that are taking advantage of the system and you know about it and you know how they're doing it, you can, you know, tell your local law enforcement. Let them know. Let them know this is how they're taking advantage of us, and that will help us out tremendously. Okay, uh, Mr. Devlin. Good morning. Um, thank you um, for uh, having. Um, me here. My name is Joseph Devlin with the City of Sacramento. Um, again, it is uh, an honor to be here. I would like to say thank you to Lori and everyone at the BCC. And just so um, the partnership that we have and, and have had with all of the agencies um, has been um, great and it continues to grow. But the staff that is working on this at all these different departments are all fantastic. And um, it's probably more a labor of love at this point than anything else because this is you know 50 60 hour a week job for probably about everybody um, Sacramento has had cannabis um, I'll say legal in some form since beginning in 2010 we began with dispensaries we currently have 30 storefront dispensaries and we have since adopted regulations for cultivation manufacturing distribution uh, as well as delivery. We are in the process of permitting um, some 230 applications um, across those, those various sectors of the industry. Um, and like anything else cannabis related, it's complicated and it's a process. Um, um, our current enforcement model utilizes a um, a joint um, or multidisciplinary team that includes police officers uh, that, um, that are sworn code officers, building investigators, um, fire inspection or fire prevention officers, uh, as well as our, our city attorney's office. Um, and it really takes a collaborative effort when you start looking at kind of the, the different uh, areas that cannabis and uh, illicit cannabis um, um, operates within within our community. We really, in California, we really have two illicit markets in this state. We have one that is internal that serves the population uh, that lives here and that consumes cannabis. We also have an external um, illicit market that, uh, uh, as Jonathan uh, alluded to, is somewhere between five he said eight, I've heard as many as ten um, um, times what we consume. And so you start thinking about those whole numbers. If we're a state of 40 million people and we're growing cannabis for a gross population, which is five times what we consume, or 10, that's a cannabis for a population between 200 and 400 million people, right? So at 10, it's pretty much the entire United States and then some. Um, and then we have an internal market. And they both come with different enforcement in different enforcement challenges. Um, in Sacramento, we have what we believe is part of that export market. We have somewhere between the numbers getting smaller, um, but I'll just say around five to 600 residential homes that have been converted, converted to commercial cultivation facilities. Uh, they are in every neighborhood. If you know someone that lives in Sacramento or you live in Sacramento, uh, there's probably one somewhere, at least in your neighborhood, um, particularly in neighborhoods that have larger homes that are, you know, 2,000 plus square feet. Um, they are so, they generate calls for service. We've had two homicides associated with them in the past, I think, 18 months now. It's been a little while, um, but they are problematic. They um, f first, they're, they're they're vacant homes. They um, have been gutted and are full of a whole bunch of illegal wiring. Um, oftentimes, they will be stealing electricity. We've had transformers blow up in the in in the backyard. Um, you know, believe it or not, we don't get that many calls for odor because they invest a lot of money on the inside, kind of really containing this thing. Uh, but they are a significant blight. 
we have in the city have adopted an ordinance that uh, allows um, residents to grow up to six plants in their home no more than no more than that six for every plant above uh, six it's a five hundred dollar penalty using uh, that penalty um, um, we have issued now just over thirty two million dollars in property fines don't ask me how much we've actually collected to date but I'll just say it's less than thirty two million dollars um, but so far that has been our most effective tool it requ it is very labor intensive it does require a building investigator it does re require the city attorney's office to obtain a criminal search warrant and then police officers to um, to execute that warrant and then we have to destroy all this stuff and house the lights and um, that is where our probably our single largest um, enforcement focus is um, currently especially as it relates to the to the illicit market um, but um, as Jonathan alluded there is an organized element to it the Department of Justice came through um, Sacramento a couple months ago now busted I think 50 homes in Sacramento in the city and in the county um, that were all owned and controlled by the same person and um, when you start doing the math on buying 50 homes and converting them into grow houses you quickly get into the tens of millions of dollars um, so there is an organized element to, to this for the regulation of the um, the, the the legal market um, the regulated market we're primarily using code officers that we are currently putting through um, our in-house training of um, of really how to conduct inspections of a cultivation facility of a dispensary and making sure that they you know are very well versed um, in in these regulations um, we have also seen the rise of what I would kind of call like a farmers market type of retail facility that pops up they'll pop up in a grocery store parking lot in a empty warehouse um, on a vacant lot in a residential neighborhood and that we saw an increase in these after January 1 um, which really wasn't a coincidence because when all the taxes went into effect our dispensaries just a lot of our dispensaries said hey we just lost a whole bunch of our customers is prim primarily the folks that use um, or purchase a lot of cannabis um, and it looks like they went into the illicit delivery market and to these kind of like farmers markets and so taking those down requires the ability to do undercover buys which is also uh, labor intensive um, so our response to this has been to add staff um, as the city of Sacramento is not any different than most other cities in that we uh, don't have um, a surplus of police officers or recruits and so um, finding those resources within our police department um, is is currently challenging we are using um, again code officers and other building inspectors and fire inspectors for the roles that they can play um, but we really have to do a, a tightly prioritize our enforcement targets um, as it relates to, to, to cannabis. We are um, moving towards a centralized model of, of managing all of those resources and those priorities between the city attorney's office, the police department, and my office um, to, I think, again make uh, more efficient decisions around managing the totality of, of cannabis um, ultimately our, our our goal and our interest in this I, I don't believe is any different than that of the state and that is to protect public health to protect public uh, safety um, and help transition this industry into a regulated market and that is, um, I guess, one of the other challenges um, when we think about enforcement. Had we adopted and passed the equivalent of Prop 64 some 30, 40 years ago, this would have all been a lot easier. But we ignored an industry that grew up and became a multi-billion dollar industry 
that not only cultivated but manufactured and produced extracts and then waxes and shatters and then add on delivery and then we decided to regulate it well that's a lot harder especially if, you know with an industry that has that grew up not being regulated not knowing how to work with government and so that has been part of the learning process for us also i think overall we have some very good partners and, and business owners in sacramento but there's a steep learning curve for them also understanding government code understanding government regulations understanding how to obtain um, the necessary permits to, to do business. You need a license from the state, but you also need a license from the city of Sacramento, and then you also need a land use entitlement in the city of Sacramento in order to do this. And it's all fairly complicated, and it's all very brand new to pretty much everyone in this industry. Um, um, lastly, I would just say that I, I don't I don't believe that this is a a problem that we're going to be able to directly enforce our way out of. Um, I think we need to look for um, regulatory structures and rules that um, make efficient use of, of, of business models and markets um, because the, the, the war on drugs wasn't very effective at eliminating cannabis. Um, I, I, I told a room full of um, mayors and council members this a couple weeks ago, no one gets to ban cannabis. You just get to ban legal cannabis. That's all. Um, and so there's been, um, I think, some great changes in, 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 in the last draft of, of the regs, but um, I think really you know, moving forward, continuing to build that relationship with, with the Bureau, um, and possibly looking to you know, expand how we really utilize um, our limited resources and time to make strategic um, and aligned decisions to um, target enforcement. And that participation may really you know, need to include DOJ and CHP as well as you know, the BCC and CDTFA um, and, and, and others. Um, and with that, um, thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, we have any questions from the members. Looks like Mr. Sweeney's queued up there. Yeah, I, I don't know if this ties in, uh, Joe, with uh, in enforcement. But, uh, yeah, I know I see you all over Sacramento. Um, you know, with a, in a lot of meetings, uh, educating a lot of people about uh, what what's going on in this industry. Um, does what you do uh, with enforcement, does that uh, impact also what you guys are doing uh, equity-wise? Uh, uh, does that enforce, uh, does it involve folks who normally wouldn't be in the industry who are trying to come in the industry through uh, mechanisms of equity. What, what are you guys doing in the city that, how does that align or does it? Well, yeah, so that's a, that's, that's an interesting question and kind of how does it tie back to the previous question of, you know, kind of these on the street dealers. There's, there's probably some direct linkages there. I'll just say our approach currently has really been one of education. Um, we're still in the process of trying to establish um, that framework and trying to provide education, um, uh, you know, and with the, our, our equity program, um, the incentives to um, enter that regulated market space. Um, our enforcement currently isn't targeted at the you know someone selling cannabis you know on the street in, in small amounts um, it's primarily focused on the illegal residential cultivation and we're gonna probably have to um, as well as the illegal retail stores we've had to deal with a couple of those and we're gonna have to probably start dealing with delivery um, in the not so distant future uh, however, delivery is still fairly new, and we're still trying to get those people kind of through that 
through that gate, that, that gate, if you will, currently. So it's going to be, um, all of it's going to be a process. Yeah, I'll just add real quick to your question on equity um, and in enforcement at the low level. Uh, because it, it does, it, it has a possibility to impact certain communities more than others. And so I just want to say racial implicit bias training is something that every officer is going through now. They're going through it through the academy. The current officers are going to have it. The Racial Identity and Profiling Act uh, finally went online this summer. The largest agencies in the state are now collecting data on every identity, and, um, racial, gender, ethnic makeup of everyone that they come in contact with, that they stop. And that's uh, some of the large San Jose PD is one of them. LAPD, San Francisco, and San Diego, I think, are starting now. So it's, it's an issue and something that law enforcement is taking very seriously. Where it exists in law enforcement is in a, is, um, is that part of, uh, is that part of uh, Dr. Shirley Weber's? Yeah, that was the RIPA, the Racial Identity Profiling Act, right. which was Dr. Weber's legislation. Right. Um, 953, I think, in 2015. That's the regulations finally were finalized, and then that's actually law enforcement is starting to collect that data now. So. You know, we understand that that is a, it's an issue that law enforcement has to address and we are addressing it and will continue, not just in this area because it, it impacts everything that we do. Um, and, and so it's, it's present here, it's present, you know, when we talk about property crime and violent crime and everything. So it's, um, you know, just, just, you know, that is something we are continuing to work on. Mr. Chair. Well, Jonathan, thank you for your presentation. It was enlightening. There's a lot of statistics that you presented today that I wasn't aware, I mean, not that I can be aware of everything, but it was very informative. The question I have for you both is, do you see the increase since REC came on board with all your numbers of the things that you shared this morning? An increase in, in, in what exactly? In the homes and the, the people that are getting involved in the business, um, stats on uh, law enforcement, uh, all the criminal things that are happening, did those numbers increase when recreational cannabis came on board? I mean, as I said, you know, we're not collecting uniform statewide data on this. So it's, it's hard to tell right now for me to hear, sit here and definitively say, yes, there's been an increase. There were some chiefs that I talked to in different regions that said they've seen an increase in um, use by minors, and they've seen those violations go up. Uh, others, not as much, you know, maybe DUID, driving under the influence of drugs, cannabis um, impairment, has gone up in certain areas, but that's a very uh, difficult issue in and of itself, because we don't have a per se limit or a, a way to effectively test if someone is impaired by cannabis yet. The technology and the science just doesn't exist. So but that, we have a DUID task force that is looking at that specific issue. I mean, that's made up of the members just like this, you know, cross-section of every different uh, uh, interest group and, and community representatives. Um, so hopefully they come up with some good recommendations in the next year or so. But, you know, like I said, it, it's hard to tell now exactly what the impact has been statewide. I mean, there's clearly been an impact. I mean, this was a massive, massive uh, policy shift in the state. Um, but it's something that we should be tracking. We should be tracking, uh, you know, Every, every little bit that we can statewide so we know where the issues are and where we need to address them. As I, you know, in my closing, as I said, I want to keep progressing forward and make sure that we're using our time and efforts effectively and making sure that we have the data to know where the loopholes are, where the problems are, where we can do better. Um, that, that's going to be incredibly important for us to make sure that we maintain. But, you know, for now, I can't say de definitively what the, what the change has uh, really been but there, there surely has been one. Yeah. I don't think that we've seen an increase in the number of illegal residential cultivation, for example, or even really the, the number of illegal delivery companies um, operating in, in, in the city. Um, you know, if there was a kind of a shift in populations, if you will, from the you know, more legal market you know, to the illicit market, it was, I think, probably some of those younger, more um, younger consumers that use um, more cannabis and, and we saw them exit the marketplace, you know, due to um, taxation and 
Um, I, I, I think ultimately this is really around how do we, you know, funnel and kind of channel that that consumer into the into a legal framework. Mr. Chairman, I want to, want to thank you both. Um, I think you both or the groups that you represent have an incredibly challenging job uh, adapting from what we've had in the past to what we have now. But I also think, you know, your the people you represent along with those that are deciding on taxation are going to have a big part on how we how this industry survives or, or if this industry survives or what the industry looks like. Um, you know, many of us on this committee are from many different groups. We all have different issues, whether it be health care, whether it be youth, whether it be diversity and inclusion, whether it be jobs and workers. Um, I think the state did a very good job putting us all together. But all the stuff we want and do comes down to if we keep the illegal market from coming and gobbling up a large portion of the, work, the products that these folks would be selling legally. They're willing to step out and meet the regulations that are established and try to perform you know, on what we say is right. Uh, but if we are not doing stuff to take the people out of this industry that are not willing to live up to the standards and that are established, I'm fearful that these good people will be forced to make a decision to go back into the black market, to the illicit market, because it's the only way they can continue to operate. So you guys are in a very difficult position. Um, so I appreciate the work you're doing. I hope you're thoughtful, work with them on taxation, because I think that's a big part of where we drive people and how we tax or how we reward those that are doing the right things. Maybe you tax it first to enforce and then you rebate to people afterwards because they've done the right thing. We've got to find a creative way to take the illicit market off the table. And I agree with Mr. Cermak here is that we've got to look at that differently because there is no small illegal operator. It, the illegal operation, whether it be a hundred small time guys or one big guy, are gobbling up what these folks could be making that could be paying the taxes, that could be creating the jobs, that could be doing the equity work. So it's very important that work they're doing. So keep working with the agency and let's make this work. Thanks. Ditto. <laughs> To hold it down, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much for both your presentations. They were both very interesting, um, enlightening. My question is actually a little bit different, um, shifting away from sort of enforcement against the market and the industry. I'm curious about what um, formal policy shifts or trainings has happened um, by law enforcement in terms of interaction post Prop 64 with cannabis consumers or people perhaps working in the industry now lawfully. Um, so prior to Prop 64, you know, it was a big gray area, but technically it was illegal, and certainly things like the smell of cannabis was used as a basis to stop and search uh, people's persons, vehicles, things like that. Now we're living in a world where a large category of that activity um, that could um, lead to smell or other indicia that someone's possessed cannabis um, is lawful. Either someone was lawfully using it and then went out, or perhaps someone works in cultivation all day long and leaves and smells of cannabis. Um, and so in terms of how law enforcement now interacts with individuals and consumers, um, and if there's a shift in training in terms, Prop 64 said specifically that lawful activity was not to be treated as a basis of detention or search, what's going on with law enforcement in terms of policies or trainings um, to address that issue? Yeah, so post uh, Peace Officer Standards of Training, it's the statewide commission that develops all the training for law enforcement. Um, I know they have done some educational uh, programs around cannabis following the passage of Prop 64. Uh, I'm almost positive that smell is no longer probable cause to search somebody, but I, I want to check on that and, and let you know um, that in every case that, that would not warrant probable cause to search a house or a vehicle or a person. Um, but I don't want to be misquoted, so let me make sure on that one. Uh, I, I don't know the details of the training, the course that POST is offering. I haven't gotten to sit through one of them or see one, but I can make sure I get an outline of that and send it to you if you, if you like to take a look because, yeah, th there has been an, uh, we have had to update how we do things um, post, post Prop 64. And the, the training, yeah, the training is, is definitely a big part of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have an open question for either one of you guys that is, is there a formal plan towards collecting data officially? Because it seems like everything we're talking about here is anecdotal. 
right, which is fair. Um, but really the way to tackle any issues, really start collecting data so then you can know that whatever you're, you're putting in place is working or not. And I'm sure a lot of the licensed, you know, producer process manufacturers here are competing against this black market. And what, if I'm sitting there, shoes, what I'm hearing is, doesn't sound like people get better anytime soon because of all these kind of challenges, right? So really step one is that data collection. And I don't know if there's anything going on with BCC or working with anyone to formally set up a program to collect and disseminate data. Yeah, I, I don't know at the state level. Um, I know there's legislation pending this year that would set up uniform data collection for DUID cannabis related um, impairment driving. Uh, that actually is taking legislation for us to push through to make sure that each agency is collecting the exact same type of data and we're sharing it statewide so we can collect that and see where the, what the impact has been on um, impaired driving. Uh, but as far as any other data point, I'm unaware of any effort statewide to start collecting that. But it's, I mean, you know, that's, that's one thing that I think we have to work on, find out exactly what we should be collecting and then collect it and, and make sure that information is shared. Yeah, I, I would only add really quickly that data as a whole is kind of an important piece that um, probably every collective city doesn't have um, enough of or isn't collecting, you know, enough of. Um, and getting some of those different organizations and agencies to kind of talk to, together can be a little bit challenging and that may be a place where the state can help facilitate that, that conversation a little bit better. I mean, it's not just police data, it's hospital data, it's education data, it's, it, there's a lot of different um, data points out there but they're not kind of um, blended um, into, um, into one kind of cohesive like cannabis aligned um, report in any sort of fashion. And I don't think it's strictly your responsibility, I think, uh, Ms. Ajax said, the question really is, is where is that in BCC's kind of priority list of things to tackle? Is that a second stage thing or? Yeah, it, it's on the priority list, obviously. Um, as we start issuing the annual licenses for all three licensing authorities, then those licensees are going to be in track and trace. We know we're going to get a lot of data from track and trace. Uh, we'll be able to uh, produce more data on the certificate of analysis lab results, where cannabis is going, all of those things. And those we are working together with, you know, the cities and counties because um, they're going to want a lot of that data too. And then it is working with, you know, the taxing authorities along with the, um, the other agency involved and seeing how we can put all that data together in one place because we all are collecting data separately. And so that is one of the things we're looking at this year on how we can have one source where all that data uh, filters in. I think right now with the temporary licenses, it's just not, it's not been there, but I think as we see the annual licenses coming on board, you're gonna see a lot more of that. Good morning, thank you to both of our presenters. I have a quick request, anything that is sent in response to a question, if you could send it to the Bureau yep. for distribution of the committee, because I think we'd all like to see it. Quick question, Mr. Devlin, in Sacramento. Has there been any effort to engage the consumer in terms of education about what's legal, what's not legal? Um, because I think you're absolutely right to say that we can't arrest our way out of an illegal market for really any drug, it seems to me. Um, and that part of, part of the equation that has been missing, in my estimation, is just letting people know, hey, this delivery service is not legal, this one is. Um, it's really confusing out there. And so I'm just wondering if there's been an effort to, to do that. So yes, there's been, there's been some. And so it's really been, again, a prioritization of, of resources. So we have a couple you know, free newspapers in Sacramento. One, that's like really the advertising hub of that. And, you know, January 1, well, December, I said, hey, anything after January, you know, needs to be a state licensed vendor. And the number of cannabis ads in that, you know, particular paper, you know, disappeared by half. Um, our public education, we did do um, some uh, web stuff. We have created a website, Know the Law. 
um, that is directed towards the general public, but really our first priority in terms of like any sort of like larger educational outreach has been directed towards youth. We're, we've partnered with the Sacramento County Office of Education and in, in, in the county um, uh, to, to launch a, a, a media campaign that includes, you know, um, uh, TV, radio, internet, and print materials to really um, primarily directed at, at, at youth. Um, I think g educating the, the general consumer is, um, will hopefully, you know, get to that. Um, but we felt that, that the youth education part was um, a little bit more of a priority. Um, I'm a little concerned uh, because of the laboratories. I understand that we only have, I'm not sure of the exact number, but I, I had heard at one point it was 19 licensed uh, laboratories. I don't know um, what. We're up to 31 at this today. Mm -hmm. All right, it's up to 31. Because I, I had heard that th that, that, had been, that was an issue, too, because everything has to go through a lab and, and be tested uh, and before it's, you know, distributed out on the streets. And um, so I, I didn't know if either, obviously anecdotally, I didn't know if that has been a, a, a point of concern. Um, do, do we have enough or, or? Probably not at, at the moment. I think the market ultimately will, you know, correct and we're going to continue to add more labs. The other kind of bottleneck right now or choke point in the supply chain is really around distribution. We don't have enough statewide distributors and the ones that are out there, you know, are, um, I've heard getting you know a pretty good price for the services of distribution, but we're going to continue to add more distribution licenses every every day and every week. And um, I, that those two pieces of the market, I believe, will sort themselves out. Again, this is going to be this is a process, and um, if this wasn't a f switch that we got to flip on January one. This was the you know the gun kind of going off and you know starting this race. My questions are always in support of the, the legitimate industry that, that's uh, developing. And um, I'm curious if we know uh, what proportion of the people undercutting that industry illicitly are uh, organized into illicit retail stores, et cetera, et cetera, and what proportion is what you, what you talked about, the, the single uh, dealer who has always been there. I, I don't know how we'd be able to figure out proportionally which is the bigger of the problems. Do you have any sense of that? No, that, that's a that's an interesting one. And again, we kind of have, we, we, we have two illicit markets, right? So the, our, the biggest illicit market that we have is really our export market by a factor of five to maybe 10. Um, the, the internal one, I don't have good data. Before we took on um, the permitting of delivery, uh, I talked to uh, a number of industry folks, including all of our dispensary owners, and everyone kind of had the general belief that the delivery market, which at the time was completely unregulated, represented somewhere between um, 40 to 55 percent of, uh, of the market share. Um, I think I've heard the the California Cannabis Industry Association come out with a number of like 53 percent, if I'm, my memory serves me right. Um, and 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 that is a, a a lower barrier to entry. I think it is a place where we can have um, folks that aren't highly capitalized. It's certainly going to be an important part of our um, of our equity program. Um, um, but as to like its exact size of, um, I couldn't speak to that. I think ultimately having legal delivery and given the choice, you know, again, taxation being kind of a little asterisk in there, the consumer is going to 
opt to 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 you know just go online and and download an app um, through a legal through a legal space versus you know finding you know that person that they used to know that you know had a hookup for cannabis that's still selling it. Okay. I just had a couple of quick ones for you guys. Um, first, I, I wanted to say I appreciated you all coming down to, uh, to our city uh, last year and spending some time with us and hosting a sort of a regional workshop on cannabis-related uh, issues. And, and I know we had uh, dozens of elected officials and decision makers uh, from around Riverside and San Bernardino counties uh, joining us um, because it is a complicated issue. Uh, and I appreciate bringing in sort of a Sacramento perspective here to Southern California as well because it's uh, I think it's important that we start to share our sort of collective stories on this and our understanding and so that sort of brings me to my first question which is uh, in, in local government we have a challenge in, in front of us and and here we're talking about enforcement and we're talking about you know issues uh, that I think we're all very familiar with uh, I wholeheartedly agree with the uh, with the data collection aspect of this, and and really encourage the bureau and others to do that, but but also encourage that expertise of being able to analyze the data, right? So it's not just as uh, just just enough to collect information, but have the right folks out there to help us identify trends and and uh, emerging issues. But from a from a local government perspective, I think our our biggest challenge is one of those that you had mentioned. Um, talking about code enforcement, right, and creating the code and, and the ordinance uh, on which we rely. Um, and what I'm not seeing out there is a lot of sort of collective sharing of information and best practices and model ordinances. Um, and I feel like every community out there is kind of off inventing their own wheel. Um, and, and I find that to be, you know, a little bit disheartening. Um, you know, we all have a different approach to this, every community is trying to establish their own ethic based on you know their their residences and their businesses of what the cannabis cannabis industry looks like in their city or in you know unincorporated county areas, um, and so everybody's going to require it's not a one size fits all. But I'm kind of shocked that we're not creating sort of a statewide forum um, where we can share those ideas and and what works and where the failures have been because certainly you know we don't need to be. Uh, uh, you know, blindly going through this alone. Um, so do you have any thoughts on how you can sort of help facilitate? Because I know Sacramento in particular, you guys have, have done an outstanding job. So how do, how do we get that information to communities uh, throughout the state? Yeah, and perhaps we can have a conversation um, a little bit more in, in depth after this. So I, there, I think there is a lot of information sharing. I think a lot of it's just being done kind of right now still peer-to-peer -peer. i mean i talk to my counterparts in oakland and san francisco and la and other cities on a on a pretty regular basis i still field calls probably at least a couple of week from you know fill in the blank location of hey how'd you guys do this um but you know there are some um I think well-run um, symposiums. There's one in, in 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 Colorado that's been going on for a couple of years, and um, um, I'll just say that a, a conversation has begun around doing that in California. And um, um, those folks have I've been in contact with with them because I I too completely agree that there really is a need to kind of you know not just share, but hopefully in some way standardize a lot of this, you know, can't we all agree that, you know, this is the best thing on this particular thing? Um, because ultimately it makes enforcement a lot easier, especially as it relates to like things like delivery and distribution. Um, but yeah, there's absolutely a need for it and, and um, happy to chat with you a little bit more offline. Yeah, and I'll share, uh, we sent a survey out to our members about two months ago, asking them those very questions. What are you doing? What's working? What's not working? What in your ordinance is helping you out? What's hindering your ability to enforce? Uh, we had 180 agencies respond. You know, that's a little over half. Um, and I've been compiling that information. And I, I don't want to put together a model ordinance. I don't want this one-size-fits-all approach isn't going to work for a state like California that's so diverse. but just more like a white paper, smart approaches. This is, this is, if you're going to do it, these are provisions in the ordinance that have worked well in different cities. I'm actually including the language from the ordinance, so if you wanted to, a city could kind of pick and choose different parts from other ordinances. Um, I was hoping to have that done 
a month ago, but this legislative session has been uh, particularly uh, busy for law enforcement, um, most folks in general. So it's, uh, it's still in the works. Um, ho I'm hoping to have that finalized pretty soon, but I do want to make sure that I get input from the right groups, League of Cities, the industry, um, some of the bigger enforcement agencies that have been, been stood up in the last few months. So, you know, because absolutely, it, you don't need to re reinvent the wheel on this one. There are things that are working well in certain areas, and those should be replicated. Um, well, yeah, and I, I'd say, you know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, you mentioned consistency across jurisdictions, and, you know, every, every community kind of wants to do their own thing. In fact, I think uh, the rest of the country sees California that way. Um, so, you know, that's kind of our ethic here. But, you know, from a, a business standpoint, that's, that's kind of a mistake, right? So there are a lot of folks who operate in more than one jurisdiction. And if we're going to normalize the industry in the state, we need to provide, I think, the industry with a little bit of assurance and, and uh, I, I guess, uh, reliability um, and, and clarity on what the rules are. Because if you know, one jurisdiction, and, and especially for those doing mobile distribution or others, um, you know, it's if, if you're crossing, you know, boundaries between cities and counties and the rules are changing as you're going, um, that, that creates, I think, a little bit of a, a problem in our communities uh, and certainly a problem for enforcement. Um, so, that, you know, that would be, I think, a big, uh, big thing for us to work on. I would see, you know, the BCC as a, as a big, obviously, a component of, of doing this, but also you know, reaching out to some of the organizations that are already there, the League of Cities uh, being one. I mean, you know, the infrastructure is already there where we do share information and collaborate with one another. So I really think that's something statewide that we should uh, start to focus on. So I'd love to be able to continue that dialogue with both of you uh, uh, later. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I'll, s I'll say to the other point, the data is only as good as how you analyze it. So 100% with that one. I mean, we can collect all the data in the world. And if you don't have the right people analyzing it, looking for the right information, it's going to be useless. So, Would it be possible when that report is finished for it to be uh, available to us? Yeah, yeah, Great. absolutely. Um, good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, just a question. Um, obviously, we want to move the illicit to the legal. Um, we've heard from people throughout the state that the taxation, you know, is an issue. And while the state is more mandated in, you know, the tax that needs to be collected, cities have some discretion in that. And so I'm just wondering if there had been any um, discussion either in Sacramento or other cities about how you could potentially tier um, based on maybe the scale of the operation. I think from... You know, my perspective, when you have basically a flat tax that's, you know, for all, um, you know, sizes of operation or you're trying to move someone from an illicit to the legal, um, the entry point becomes more difficult based on the size, based on the capital that you have behind you. So I'm just wondering if cities have explored that, um, and if so, to, to what end? Well, in Sacramento, our our tax is a 4% gross receipts tax that was adopted in 2010 by the voters. And so it was a little bit of, ahead of, you know, a, a lot of this. We haven't begun yet to have the conversation around, you know, making adjustments to, to that yet. Um, you know, however, you know, looking kind of a bit over the horizon, at some point, we may be forced to have a conversation around taxation around um, that gross receipts, particularly for distribution, uh, testing, um, and other places that might be um, a, um, a little bit more thinner margins, if you will. The other place that um, there's maybe some room for adjustment within the tax is in um, um, the calculation of um, the excise tax. And, and, and that 60% assumption rate, right, that can be adjusted every six months. And so that is one place that it could be um, lowered and adjusted. I mean, ultimately, for this whole thing to work out, my personal opinion is that um, it, and unless the consumer ultimately just moves completely into this and doesn't have a, you know, a problem paying what amounts in Sacramento 37% tax on a, on a product, if that number continues to, to be too high, um, you know, 
the city and the state, cities and states may have to figure out some sort of agreement of like, okay, well, what makes best for ev everyone? If that 15% excise tax and then the sales tax on top of it, plus the cultivation tax, um, is collectively, you know, consuming all of the tax space and isn't leaving any for the local, is there, you know, are we going to have to kind of make a little room? Um, but the CDFA, CDTFA can adjust the, the um, assumed markup rate. Yeah, I think there's enough research out there that shows that at a certain level, your taxes are going to incentivize the black market. And I've said that to the chiefs, and the League of Cities has said that to their members as well. So it's, we're aware of it for sure. Um, I know different cities are do, have different tax structures. Some do it on the canopy size. Um, some do it, you know, flat gross receipts. I, it, it depends. Um, but again, I think everyone's just trying to figure out how to maximize it without, you know, just pushing folks further and further into the illicit market. Yeah. So, so you both mentioned um, the uh, amount of resources that are needed to, you know, properly enforce or at least have some level of enforcement, and then sort of the uh, uh, personnel time, not just the resources, but the amount of time that, you know, goes into enforcement and, and building cases and so forth, and it's challenging. And then you also mentioned that, you know, there are, there's a, a resistance in, in uh, prosecution for certain types of crimes and lower level crimes. Um, and then, you know, on the heels of what you just said related to taxes, you know, there are some communities that have decided to pass, you know, prohibitions generally, um, uh, not allowing cannabis to be sold or distributed or manufactured or testing labs or whatever. Um, and so they're not collecting any type of revenue that would feed back into a more robust enforcement system like what Sacramento has. Um, and so I could see this almost as a race to the bottom in some of those communities because you don't have the resources from a tax base to provide the type of enforcement that's needed to address an illicit market, a lack of, you know, uh, interest in prosecution, um, and, you know, this uh, uh, sort of freewheeling uh, uh, you know, market that, uh, you know, will, will leak into uh, these communities that, that uh, uh, have decided to prohibit that uh, use. So, so how, do we, how do we address that? I mean, you know, what's the, what, you know, hey, you know, if you've got an idea, let me know here because, you know, what's the cost recovery, uh, you know, opportunities or things? I mean, this is a conversation that a lot of these communities are struggling with uh, from a local government perspective. And they're, they're you know, there's a, a tremendous fear generating that, you know, as you see this, and we're all dealing with this in our cities of having to shut down uh, illicit storefronts and distribution and manufacturing that we keep finding, and it takes a tremendous amount of resources to do it. And so, you know, uh, tell me how to fix that. <laughs> yeah, how much time do I have here? Um, no, it's, it's going to, I mean, resources will be key. You'll have to make sure that there's, a, you know, money in the state budget to go out to the locals for this type of work. And it's going to have to, you know, it will be. It should be structured, but it should be uh, inclusive of not just law enforcement, but code enforcement and the other agencies, the utility companies that we need their investigators to find, you know, cases of electricity theft. We need uh, the financial investigators to make sure that we're, we're hammering folks on the, the tax evasion and, you know, work work with Department of Justice on asset forfeiture deals. That's how you go up to the illicit market. And then there should be some law changes to make sure that we've got penalties on the serious violators, repeat offenders, not the first time folks, not the, the, the truly low level individuals, but guys that are taking it, guys and women that are taking advantage of the system uh, and clearly abusing the, the laws that are in place. Um, you know, that's, that, I, you got to differentiate between those two and it's, right now our laws don't. So, I mean, and unfortunately a lot of that is uh, a very, all of that's a very tall order. Um, looking at the legislative climate, politics in Sacramento, I mean, it's going to take a, a coalition of folks coming together to say, this is what we need and this is what we need done. I can't do it on my own. Law enforcement's not going to get that done. Me and the League of Cities might not even be able to get that done. I mean, it, it really takes everybody coming together to say, we need to, we need to really be serious about this. There are some things that we can all agree to. I know that everyone has political differences. You know, I'm working for law enforcement, I, you know, have to, um, you know, it, it's very controversial issues that we deal with, and everyone's got their opinion, and, and the truth is probably somewhere right in the middle. So if we can actually 
sit down, figure out exactly what needs to get done, agree, there's a chance. But um, we're, we're far from that right now, unfortunately. Just to echo those comments, enforcement is a very important component of this program. Um, but educating the public and the consumer that uh, they're getting something for that 38% tax, they're getting a safe place to buy their cannabis, they're getting a tested product, they can be confident that the product that they're getting, um, the amount that they're getting is what they're paying for because Weights and Measures has measured the scale and certified the scale. Um, they know that if they're getting a product that says it's 20% THC, it's 20% THC because it's been tested. They're getting things. So enforcement is a good component of a program, but educating the consumer to get the market to drive itself to the legal providers um, is just as big of a, a component, and that can be done through either PSAs, um, you know, anything on the web, website uh, enhancements, um, just it, alerting the people, these are the legal operators, this is what you get when you pay that high tax rate, and, and encouraging people to buy legal is what's going to help with the market be healthy. I, I do have a question. Please. Um, so it seems like we've heard a lot about um, indoor grow houses being a real kind of thorn in lots of municipality sides. And with the um, passage of Proposition 64 and the ability for individuals to cultivate six plants, um, and not have that be banned outright. It seems like many jurisdictions have forced personal cultivators to move that personal cultivation indoors and have prohibited it from appearing outdoors. I'm wondering if that movement into personal cultivation indoors and that allowance has created challenges when trying to distinguish between um, personal cultivation indoors and say illicit cultivation indoors and if there couldn't be a solution by offering more transparency for personal cultivation, i.e. allowing it outdoors? I don't, I don't think so, not in this, at least in the city of Sacramento. Um, you know, we have zero interest in the person who's growing seven plants, I mean, just to be honest. Um, you, you're not even going to be a blip on our, on our radar. Um, the houses that we're going into and in, in, in executing search warrants on have 700 plants, have 1,500 plants in them. Um, it's not, you know, six persons or seven plants um, uh, inside. The challenge with the outdoor, at least in, um, say, like a, a more urban environment, you can smell, you know, I'm waiting for it, right? September, October, I'm going to start getting a lot of calls, at least a handful. Um, six or seven plants grown in your backyard. I mean, I, I personally don't mind the smell of cannabis. Um, if part of, like, hazard of the job, come to really appreciate the different, the different terpenes. Um, but by, by smell only. Um, but... But but they can be very pungent, and and like how do you kind of balance that within a community, right? I mean, six plants you could smell from you know several houses away, and so it's it's really kind of a a quality of life I think life item for you know especially within an, an urban environment. So I think you know indoor cultivation and for personal use is going to probably be something that you know many cities adopt. Yeah, I, I, as I kind of mentioned briefly, uh, probably the best way to help law enforcement identify where the illegal indoor grows are versus the legal grows are to require re anyone who grows legally to report it. So, uh, for example, Davis has, you actually have to get a license to grow indoors. Um, I don't know if it's overly restrictive. It can't be because they would have been sued for it. Um, but it, it's a way so that the city and the department knows who's growing. So that way, if you see electricity spike in, an, in a house, law enforcement can take a look and say, okay, well, they do have, a, uh, they have you know, reported that they are growing indoor plants. You know, they have their six. We've checked it out. It all, it all uh, checks out fine. Um, and then they can move on to the next. But if you see a house that has a you know, high usage of electricity, uh, that has not reported to the city that they're growing indoor, that's the way that we can identify the illegal operators there. Um, indoor versus outdoor, I don't know if it's had much of a difference either way on uh, increasing the likelihood of indoor illegal grows. 
We, we use a number of ways to kind of identify those uh, Ill illegal cultivators, and I'll just say that the the the, the tools that we we use um, they they really stand out at at some point. We kind of draw lines in the sand, and kind of everybody below that is like, okay, you know like specific to maybe electricity if you are running your heater your air conditioner you know your pool heater your hot tub and every appliance you owned you're still not even coming close to the amount of like electricity that a lot of these um, homes use I mean they're blowing up transformers in backyards they're melting the wiring because they're drawing so much current it's they're they're very different than somebody you know who's maybe growing a few more plants than they should Hey, gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, joining us here today. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, oh. that's you, sorry. Can I add one more comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your presentation today. I just wanted to see what your insight is in terms of the land use or zoning in Sacramento has been for businesses trying to seek their license, and if that has had a significant impact on businesses trying to be zoned correctly, but then they face challenges and barriers to entry into the market because the prices of the appropriate lo the appropriately zoned areas are just out of reach. So you need two approvals in the city of Sacramento to operate, well, three. Um, in the city of Sacramento to operate a cannabis business, you need a state permit, you need the local business operating permit, and then you need a conditional use permit, which is that land use entitlement that says you can do that thing there. We use them for drive-throughs and all sorts of other things, gas stations. Um, we didn't set geographic boundaries as to where that, um, where those activities could occur. Uh, however, we did set zoning and, and some, I'll say, um, light distance requirements from from things like parks and obviously the, the, the school requirement. And just those two simple things of um, requiring it to be done in a commercial or you know industrial zone land 600 feet from a park really concentrated our available area in the, in, into two parts of the city. There has been a, a significant amount of, uh, I'll say, land speculation taking place in, in, in two of those areas. Um, and it, it has been um, a, a, a challenge um, for some people wanting to enter the in industry to find properties. It's also been a challenge for existing businesses that have been there for some amount of time who've been essentially you know, rent evicted um, because their landlord wants to bring somebody else, uh, else in. Um, we are also kind of connecting the data question. We are also looking at um, updating a study that was done by a professor at UCLA a couple of years ago at our dispensaries. So I've been in communications with her. We're going to be updating that, studying to include um, our dispensaries and cultivation and manufacturing facilities, really around crime associated with um, in or around um, cannabis properties. And so hopefully we'll be moving forward to update that study here, here pretty quickly. Hope I answered your question. All right. Well, again, thank you both for joining us here today. Yes. All right. Next up, uh, I think we'll go ahead and open it for uh, public comment. Um, now, just wanted to uh, highlight one quick thing. Public comment is exactly that comment. It's not questions directed to the uh, speakers today. Um, but uh, if you have any comments on what you've heard today, we'd love to hear it. And just a reminder, if you have a comment, please line up on this right aisle. Um, we'll start with speaker one. Thank you. Susan Tibben. Mr. Devlin spoke about increased interdiction of Oxycontin, fentanyl, heroin. Legacy farmers in small rural communities have few, if any, job or career opportunities. And in many ways, these families mirror the growing pockets of meth, Oxycontin, fentanyl, heroin use, with the attendant renting of the social fabric. We have an opportunity to change that paradigm by offering small legacy farmers a place via an affordable home business in the legal market, or we can continue to, to find them, finding people whose median income has been $45,000,
doesn't make a whole lot of sense for anybody. Enlisting community members to report unlicensed farmer neighbors promotes hopelessness, illegality, suicide, and a never-ending drain on rural law enforcement and a bright, shiny new bureau war on drugs. Instead, work with us. Craft a small home business license immediately. Be responsible for adding our taxes instead of destroying our economy and our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker two. Hi, Paul Hansberry. Um, I thought it was very interesting that the speaker spoke about the different tiers of, uh, that they have to enforce, that they're the people that are they're putting 1,500 plants in, in an abandoned house. Then there's the people that, that are still doing it, because, but they can't uh, get their license. They can't, they, there's too many barriers for them. It's either too expensive, or they can't comply, or they live in the wrong part of town. Um, I think that the, they were talking about incentives, but not from the Bureau. I don't see any real incentives. Uh, I see a lot of regulation. Um, the regulation seems to be of a mindset that, that they're being forced, that the voters force them to write regulations to allow a criminal activity instead of stimulating an industry that's already, they're built the regulations around the industry that exists instead of trying to play Simon Says and do it our way and incentivize the people that have been doing it for, for years to come in and to do that. They really want to do that. The people that are destroying homes and going in, in national forests, and we don't want those people around either. But give, incentivize the people that want to come in to come in instead of building more barriers. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker three. Uh, yes, my name is Joshua Jenkins. I'm the chief executive officer of Loyal Penguin. Um, my company has been trying to um, bring attention to various different things, and we don't have informational presentations that we can use to lobby for advancement of regulations and for this to continue to be looked at as if it is some sort of crime to be associated with cannabis. While there is alcohol regulations that are on a books, they aren't also hunting down moonshiners that are still operating in the mountains of North Carolina, even though everybody knows that's happening. So con to continue to come to this committee and to advocate for and to lobby, because that's what happened today. It was not an informational presentation. It was a lobbying effort by the California Police Chiefs Association, so congratulations to them, using anomalies in the statistics and the crime data to scare each and every one of you into going along with their efforts without having no actual data associated with that, acknowledging the failure of actual data points to be collected. So they're continuing to push the war on drugs. That's happening. And you're all being subject to having to listen to that, so are we, and that's wrong. Because this is now being deep regulated, that we are moving away from the prohibition that has existed for 70 years. And we need to continue to move forward and to continue to strive in better direction than we are looking at it as some presumption of guilt associated with being in the industry. There will be people that break the law and there are financial laws in, order, in place right now to protect just like every other business has to. So I would just ask that Ignore the statistical anomalies and look at the actual data. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Speaker one. Good morning. My name is William Perno. I'm a prevention specialist for alcohol and other drug prevention here in San Diego. And I wanted to share some data points for you that you can look at right now today. The um, San Diego County Marijuana Prevention Initiative has resources on their website, including data for youth use of marijuana here in San Diego. What I can tell you, uh, the number one reason for youth and county funded drug treatment programs aged 12 to 17 in San Diego County is marijuana. Recently, just this week or a few days ago, Sandeg, San Diego Association of Governments released a um, SAMI survey, which is substance abuse monitoring for youth, showing what's going on in our juvenile detention facilities here in San Diego. 91% 
of the youth that go into the juvenile facilities that take the survey are positive for marijuana and use. Average age of first use of marijuana for those justice-involved youth is 12 years of age was the first time they started using marijuana. Our emergency room data discharges are going up across California. Here in San Diego, the chief con uh, medical complaints regarding marijuana are chest pain, psychosis, and cannabinoid hyperemesis. So what I would encourage is for you to look at those data points here. The California Healthy Kids Survey as well shows information on marijuana and see what's happening there. Our San Diego County, um, in San Diego Imperial County, Haida has also tracked information. But I want to talk um, specifically about funding for enforcement. I know that there was a budget item in the state budget for $14 million for regional narcotics task forces that did not pass. What we're seeing in the smaller cities is they don't have the resources as you heard today particularly for small cities that don't have a police department or a city attorney's office. So I would ask you really to look at regional resources for that. The alcohol beverage control uses um, alcohol policing partnerships models to be a force multiplier by grant monies to law enforcement agencies. I know Chief Ajax is very familiar with that. And that enforcement and prosecution is key because in my city, we don't have a city prosecutor's department to even prosecute the cases if they come forward. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker two. Hi, my name is John Tibbetts, and I'm here from Packed Packaging uh, up in Huntington Beach. Uh, thank you for taking our comments. I want to speak for a minute on the uh, legal side of the cannabis industry um, and the fairly constant changing regulations in terms of the child resistance uh, requirements. Can, so we're, we're taking public comments on the presentations that we just saw on enforcement. Uh, if you have generalized public comments, we'll be addressing that after the next presentation. Okay, this is about enforcement. Um, so, uh, for some context, packaging does take quite a lot of time. Uh, so you're talking about weeks or months to develop, manufacture, ship, and fill packaging. So in terms of the uh, child resistance regulations and the enforcement of them, uh, there has been some shifts as of this past Friday about how that is being uh, handled. Uh, and it appears we are looking at going back to... So I'm still going to have to cut you off there and say that that wasn't part of the presentation. We're taking comments on the presentation itself and what we've heard from those gentlemen. Okay, thank you. Speaker three. Hi, my name is John Barthel. I'm a CPA. I work in the cannabis industry with multiple clients. Number one, I appreciate what you guys are doing. You know, you're working hard. You're trying to make a difference. What it comes down to is on enforcement. They spoke here about, oh, enforcement, this and that. What it comes down to is the taxation. You know, if we can't eliminate some level of the taxation in this industry, because, I mean, it's just a stacking element. You, the more you enforce, the higher the tax go, the more you got to enforce. I mean, we can't just keep putting law enforcement to fix the problem. What it comes down to is why do we buy a beer at the store? Because it's cheaper than the moonshine, right? The fact is, in our industry right now, there, it's cheaper to go to the legal market by half of what the cost is in the legal market. We're overtaxed. The city of San Diego, it's over 40% to bring that product in. We don't need more enforcement by law enforcement. We need cheaper cost of our product to our licensed retails. You know, you look at our small business re retailers, they can't even get in the same. You got a million dollars, keep it at home. Because the fact is, we're handing our industry to large corporations because it's a loss leader. There's nobody making money in this industry right now. And so law enforcement is not the right solution. The solution is lower cost. Lower cost means that people will go to the legal industry. The other thing is that we've allowed these cities to basically build structures of overtaxation and control, and some don't want to be dispensaries. I mean, the fact is we need to open the market. We need to allow the small business in. We need to lower the taxation. I know we have a, we're going up to Sacramento, and they're going to be talking about that soon, but it's not law enforcement. Increasing law enforcement won't help this. It's a matter of fact of lowering the barriers of entry to the legal market. Speaker one. Speaker one. Good morning. Um, my name is Anna Foster. I'm representing Mendocino County this morning, and I just wanted to reiterate support uh, for Ms. Mrs. Lynch's comment. Um, the biggest barrier to entry for small farmers is taxation, and we support um, your comment in terms of uh, small cottage specialty produ producers uh, should have its own scale and price to size. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker two. My name is Laura Wilkinson. First, I'd like to thank all of you for coming to the great city of San Diego, America's finest city. We love having you here. And as we know, San Diego lags the state 
in both ordinances and permitting of dispensaries, of legal dispensaries. I want to use Chula Vista as an example of the issues they're having with law enforcement. They are working, meaning the city of Chula Vista is working in good faith to permit dispensaries. They've passed their ordinance and are awaiting a vote in November. Yet they spend an inordinate amount of time and unbudgeted funds to close down illegal dispensaries, which invite crime. And what happens is we have a media that loves those stories. So now we're getting a reputation for dispensaries here in San Diego County with the general public and with other city council members of other cities that have yet to write ordinances as a permit that we are hotbeds of crime. They, are, they have not read the regulations that have been written. They're unaware of the state regulations regarding everything from opaque packaging to the security things, which, you know, you're locked down like a bank. You bring safety to a community. And yet the public and most city council members, including many in Imperial Beach, were, whose meeting I was at last night when they passed their permit, are unaware of these safety regulations. We need your information to get to city council members and the general public to help law enforcement, because these are unbudgeted funds they're using. They're trying to close down these illegal ones so they can permit legal ones, and they are caught in this catch-22. So they do need your assistance with law enforcement, genuinely. And as somebody who is associated with legal dispensaries, we know our reputations are suffering from this, and the public is becoming very misinformed. So we'd appreciate your help in helping us get the legal market going with information, especially down here in San Diego County, where we lag the rest of the state. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Speaker three. Uh, yes, hello. My name is Adam Villarreal. I'm a manufacturing manager for Dragon Corp. We're a social equity incubator. Um, I wanted to reaffirm to one of the earlier speaker's points about taxation. But again, in expanded scope, all of this seems really hard and to cost a whole lot, like in very plain language. You know, even going through, as a social equity incubator, looking at some of the requirements that it takes for people to get into the program. This is the program to go out and help people. And, and for example, it was uh, myself, my associate, and one other company that was there at the SERS presentation through LAFD. You know, people, they don't even know about these things. Some of the things that are on the list, you know, and y you put this in front of someone who's a small to medium-sized business owner, who is totally unfamiliar with these regs. There's a breakdown in the way the information gets from you guys' office, funnels through, and gets to the people. And so, people so are just again, kind of behind. How does, we need to make sure that this comment relates to the presentations on enforcement. Yes. Um, and the reason that I would be speaking to that is because people aren't even getting that far. You have people that are still confused, still mired in the levels of cost, in the complication of the application process, and they're behind in enforcement as well. So, like, bringing the level of these, <laughs> these requirements onto people, it, it's just not working, and that's, that's what I wanted to speak to. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker one. Hi, my name is Josh Sweeter from Infinite Chemical Analysis Labs. I just wanted to comment on a comment that was made during the question, and it's gonna <coughs> proceed for later. Uh, there's 31 licensed labs, right? Out of the 31 labs, how many have a door to open? I believe it's only about 19. I think that someone said that over here. From the 19, how many are running compliance tests? I believe there's 12. How many are running phase two compliance tests? There's less than that. I just wanted to, and that can all be found out by looking at who's turning in the COAs to us. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments? All right. Okay. Well, uh, it looks like we have our next, uh, I'm sorry. Are you com <clears throat> if you like, comment. All right, my name's Paul. This is an emotionally charged subject for me. I used to be a Canis Regar. Um, I can't anymore because I live in San Diego. When people talk about San Diego, all they talk about is dispensaries and storefronts. It's as if the plant comes from outer space. Uh, and talk about legal problems and, the, and law enforcement and what they want and what everyone in this whole picture wants. There's a lot of talk about money, taxes, generating revenue. There are people involved in this whole thing. Small businesses ought to be able to operate. If you put massive barriers to it, then you end up with people doing things that they shouldn't be doing. 
I'm looking at growing microgreens to make a living. No one in here understands about, everyone's got this idea that it's all propped up on these high prices on what the illegal market once was. It's not like that anymore. The dispensaries are concerned about people <clears throat> and law enforcement about buying low-priced marijuana on the streets. Well, if a pound of marijuana in, in Northern California goes for $500, but an ounce is $350 at a dispensary, what are people going to do? And people have got to think about this. You've got to think it through. You've got to think about how much you're going to tax people. You've got to look at, okay, well, I'm not going to break down the math for you right now. You, uh, everyone else can spend their time on that later, but do the math on it. If, if, if you're charging a grower $9.25 per ounce and you've got all these other harvest tax on it and everything else, people are losing their businesses in Northern California right now that are regulated. It is a major, major problem. From my understanding, less than 1% of the state's growers are licensed. I heard that less than, there's a 97% failure rate on what's coming through the labs being tested. So then what? Then people can buy like a $70, $80 eighth at, at a dispensary? Sorry, your, your time is up. Okay, well. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. I hope we can all figure it out. All right, so <laughs> speaking of taxes, our, uh, our, our next speaker this morning is uh, Nicholas Maduros, Director, California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, here, uh, here this morning. Good morning to uh, speak to us, provide a bit of an overview on California's cannabis taxes. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me uh, this morning. Again, my name is Nick Maduros. I'm the Director of the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, which I like to say is only 70% as bureaucratic as it sounds. Um, I'd like to start today by giving you a, a brief overview of how the uh, tax structure works around cannabis in the state of California, and then I'll uh, follow that with a discussion of some issues that we're seeing uh, in the uh, tax system as it relates to cannabis. And, um, anyway, so CDTFA, the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, administers more than 30 taxes for the state of California, including the three that are applicable to cannabis. That's the cultivation tax, the excise tax, and the sales tax. The cultivation and excise tax are centered around uh, <coughs> cannabis distributors. The sales tax is paid to the state by the retailers. Um, if, starting with the cultivation tax, uh, it's imposed upon all harvested cannabis that enters the commercial market. Uh, we consider cannabis to enter the commercial market once it has passed the testing phase, once it's um, that's when it's eligible to go into the market, and that's when it's, the tax is due. Uh, two can, uh, cultivation tax rates were established by statute. Uh, that's the flower tax, as was mentioned. It's $9.25 per dry weight ounce. Again, that was established by law. We, we don't uh, change that tax rate. And then leaves were established at $2.75 per dry weight ounce. CDTFA can establish additional tax rates, and we have to date established one for live uh, or for fresh cannabis. Uh, that third can uh, category uh, is taxed at a rate of $1.29 per ounce. So that's the cultivation tax. It is paid, again, by the cultivator to the distributor. The distributor remits that tax quarterly to the state of California. The excise tax is 15% uh, tax. Now, it gets a little confusing because it's not a 15% tax on the sale price. It's a 15% tax on the average market price of the retail sale. So this structure was established because the taxpayer is the distributor rather than the retailer on the excise tax. So as was mentioned again earlier, every six months, uh, the CDTFA uh, statisticians work to determine what the average uh, markup rate is statewide. It was set at 60% uh, in December of last year for the first six months, and it was kept at 60% uh, for the period of July through December of this year. So that means that the 
tax is 15% of the wholesale price paid by the retailer, or the wholesale price plus 60%, and then you take that and it's a 15% tax on that. Now, it's also important to recognize that the sales tax is due on that entire portion, including the excise tax. Um, the third tax, again, is the sales tax. This is just like it, it's paid by retailers, just like on any other sale of tangible personal property in the state of California. It's seven and a quarter percent uh, statewide, and then there are some uh, local and district taxes above and beyond that, up, uh, up to, I think, the highest in the state now is around nine and three quarters, I think, uh, in some jurisdictions, but it's seven and a quarter is the, is the statewide rate. Again, these taxes are all filed quarterly. Our next, so we've gone through one quarter uh, with the April 30th filing deadline. Uh, as you may have read, the taxes were, taxes collected were uh, substantially lower, I think, than, than earlier estimates of what the uh, tax collection would be. At the end of this month, we'll have our second quarter due. Um, we are, have been operating under emergency regulations since December of last year. We are starting the uh, formal permanent regulation process tomorrow. With a, uh, we will be distributing a draft discussion paper for public comment. We will have a public uh, interested parties meeting on August 2nd of this year for anyone interested in uh, discussing uh, or commenting on those proposed regulations. So that's sort of how the tax structure works. Now, if I could go through a few of the issues that we're confronting. One, I, taxes around cannabis, just like around all things, are complicated. And we have tried our level best to get around the state to uh, put together, to explain to people how to comply with the law, to put together videos that are available on our website, explaining uh, to people in various parts of the industry how to comply. We've established and had two meetings of a, a cannabis tax working group uh, that uh, helps to advise us on areas that may be unclear where we need to provide greater clarification. We've received a lot of comments and questions, including around very detailed sections of the tax code that we've attempted to answer, and we've put those answers uh, online for anyone who might be interested. Uh, we're open to all suggestions as to how we can uh, greater clarify what the tax laws are. Our goal is for people, is, is for voluntary compliance, and we recognize that there are many people who uh, do want to comply, but the system is complicated. On the cultivation tax, uh, one area of particular complication has been that it, it turns out it's difficult to uh, monitor exactly how much of the product goes into uh, a, a certain edible or into the, into the final product, how much of the, the plant material goes into each uh, manufactured product. We recognize that. We're working to try and simplify that so that people can comply, but that is an issue that is, is complicated uh, in the current tax code. On the excise tax, the markup uh, is, uh, is, remains a challenge. I think once track and trace is fully up and running and online, we'll have a lot, of, a lot more data around what that markup rate should be. Uh, in the absence of a uh, ton of, uh, in the absence of uh, sufficient reliable data, we did keep that market rate at 60%. I think there are indications in the, market, in the marketplace that the market is actually higher than 60%. Um, but to be sure, we have kept it there uh, for the time being. Cash is, has been a big issue for us, as you may have heard how to actually collect the taxes from people who are, uh, in many instances, unable to access the banking system. We have struggled with this. Uh, it's both a logistical challenge and it's, it's a 
public safety issue, both for the taxpayers and for uh, our team members and for the general public. We now have 11 uh, sites around the state uh, where we will accept cash payments from taxpayers uh, by appointment. Uh, we have a, a set of strong security protocols, but this is still obvious. This is not our ideal solution, but we are doing our level best to make it work, uh, both for taxpayers and for the state. Um, and lastly, I just mentioned enforcement and what we're seeing there. There clearly is a lot of um, non-compliance in the marketplace. We have sent teams out around the state to uh, almost every retailer we could find. This doesn't generally include the, the uh, delivery services. Unlike many other departments that are involved in this, we do have uh, substantial resources and teams available for compliance uh, because we do uh, enforce many other taxes in the state of California. So we have more than a thousand compliance professionals around the state and a thousand auditors around the state. We have found very large um, percentages of businesses that don't have permits from us. And our permits are available almost as a matter of right, so we, we're not selective. If, you, uh, if you'd like to get a seller's permit from us and you don't have a, a huge tax liability already, we will give you a seller's permit. So when people don't have our permits, that's a, a really troubling sign. And our, having our permits is a precondition to having uh, permits from BCC and others in this process. Many don't have the necessary local permits, don't have the BCC permits. Uh, we have begun enforcing uh, our tax laws against some of those establishments. I think we can expect more enforcement as we go forward from those who are not compliant. And again, this is not for uh, individual businesses. I mean, just like any business, we will uh, eventually get to a place where we're auditing people and making sure that they're being truthful in their filings. What we're focused on now are people who are n not even um, making any attempt to comply with the tax laws, and that operating even without permits. Uh, there are, it, it is a felony to, uh, to evade more than $25,000 in California taxes. Given the tax rates that are there uh, in the state of California, it doesn't take too much to get to $25,000 worth of taxes um, evaded. It is also, we are also able to assess or impose $5,000 fines on uh, businesses that do not allow our inspectors into the premises. We have also issued some of those fines uh, as we've sent people out in some uh, businesses uh, have not allowed our uh, our um, tax enforcement professionals to even come inside to see whether or not they're they have the available the necessary permits. So we're working on enforcement. Uh, I think that clearly is an area where we where there's a lot more to be done and where we're looking to partner with um, local prosecutors, especially. So if there are um, individual jurisdictions that are interested in partnering with us, we would certainly welcome that. That's sort of the universe of what we are doing. Um, the team at CDTFA has been working incredibly hard, uh, just as the team at BCC and the Department of Agriculture. This has been a real sprint to get to this place and to set up a pretty complicated tax structure in a relatively short period of time. Um, and uh, again, I just would like to say if there are uh, any questions from taxpayers, our goal is, uh, just as, as it is with any of our tax programs, to achieve voluntary compliance and to help those individuals and businesses that want to comply. So we certainly um, look for any opportunity to work with industry or others uh, to make that happen. All right. Well, thank you so much. Let's uh, go ahead and see if any of the members have questions. Yes, the, the question I have is, you know, we heard a lot about the tax work you're doing here. What, 
Is your department the appropriate department, or do you know what department would be to start working with the federal government on 280E reform? I think the impact on these businesses and their ability to spend and pay the taxes we're asking would be dramatically improved if they could have some write-offs. I know in the state of California we could do stuff, but you know we need to we need to help them with that because they have an undue burden there that no other business that we're taxing in the state are stuck with. So, well. That's, uh, I mean, typically on the income and business taxes, franchi the Franchise Tax Board is, is uh, working more closely with the IRS, but I think all of us are in this strange boat, including, frankly, the IRS, where they're also having to figure out how to collect taxes in cash. Um, it's, it's, it's a real problem, and, and it, it extends beyond, obviously, the cash to other um, expensing provisions, but I, I, I think that I don't know that it'd be CDTFA since we we don't uh, get generally involved in income tax issues. Um, are you aware of, of the city of city and county of San Francisco? I'm aware of it, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, well, that's good point one, very good. <laughs> uh, uh, are, are you aware that they are considering a uh, gross receipts uh, tax um, on 500000 or more with an exemption for um, um, campus uh, that is being used for medical purposes or medicinal purposes. Are you, are I, I'm not aware of their, that specific proposal, but there are many jurisdictions. And I should add also that for there is there is a sales tax um, exemption for uh, medicinal sales if the purchaser has the state card. We also do uh, not collect the excise tax if. Uh, for compassion programs where the cannabis is donated, so. so. So you are taking the compassion piece into consideration? We are. That was a question that has come up repeatedly, and we've issued formal guidance that if a business does um, uh, provide without charge cannabis through a compassion program that they can uh, ask for, and we will provide a refund on any taxes paid, on the excise taxes paid. Well, well you know, so you were breaking down the taxes, and I was starting to take notes until I realized that I was not understanding everything you were saying. Um, do you have a, uh, a sheet uh, that you pass out that sort of lays all this out? Funny so you should mention that, sir. I've got some, I've got some here. I wasn't sure how many people would would be here, but I'd be more than happy to. Well, it's generally 22 is a little less than that. So yes, thank you. I have a question, if I may. So I, Susan, you just mentioned that um, with the compassion program that um, CDTFA is open to the concept of refunding the excise tax, but what happens about the cultivation tax that's assessed? The cultivation tax is, is still due. It's, it, because the trigger for the cultivation tax is when it enters the commercial market, uh, which is when the, the product passes testing. It was our legal analysis that we were not able to um, to refund that tax, but because the other is is contingent upon the sale, that we were um, able to refund. Okay, um, and then second part of my question is, um, in the previous presentation, we heard a lot about enforcement issues and um, concerns about there maybe being too many barriers and a challenge for especially cultivators to come into the marketplace, but. With the current tax structure, as the prices fall in the marketplace, which um, is kind of diversified depending on how you cultivate. So for outdoor cultivators, they're always at kind of the, the lowest, um, 
of the sector of wholesale prices versus you know you move into more intensive forms of cultivation like greenhouse your pricing generally goes a little up in the market you move indoors the pricing goes up even farther so I mean I'm having some pretty substantial concerns about what happens to our seasonal cultivators which traditionally has been the largest body of cultivators in the state but um, at prices this year of around $500 a pound, that cultivator is paying a 32% gross receipt tax versus, say, a cultivator receiving $1,000 a pound is up at 17%. So is there any way CDTFA foresees bringing some equity balance to how the tax system works for cultivators? So is there a way to create some sort of tier production opportunity or... Um, the tax rates, we administer the taxes. We don't set the tax rates. I mean, we can create other categories as we did with the fresh plant, um, but in terms of dried flower or dried leaves, those rates are set um, in statute, so I don't know that we could. So incentives couldn't potentially be considered a new tax rate? And just like a tiered system, you would have a 925 I, at one tier and then? I don't, we couldn't do that ourselves. Um, but if that were the decision of the legislature and the governor, we would will implement whatever it is we are we are told. And one thing that is interesting to me, because I hear a, a lot of um, concerns about price and and the market, it, if in fact the markup is a hundred percent from or or even higher than 60% or even 60%, that's a, that's a pretty big markup um, and one that I would suspect over time you'll see variation in there that would impact price as well. I, um, but I think some of the market comes down to the expenses that retailers face due to the inability to take um, deductions because of 280E. So their tax rates just in general under 280E are much higher than, say, any other retail entity. That's so a good, fair some point. of their markup rates are, are directly correspond to what they're suffering from under yeah. 280E. That's a fair point. Okay, I just have that quick one for you. Um, excise tax. Can you explain, because that sounds a little, uh, little bit on the fuzzy math side right now until uh, track and trace uh, gets put into place. So can you explain that just a little bit more for me? Sure. So the excise tax is 15%. You take the wholesale cost. So we do know exactly what the retailer is paying for the product. Uh, but because the, the tax is paid by the distributor uh, and they collect the tax, tax from the retailer. Uh, the tax is remitted by the distributor, I should say. It's, it's paid even by the consumer. The consumer has to bear that 15% excise tax. So say the wholesale cost is $100. We would add the 60% markup and the tax would be on 15% of $160. Uh, that's one sort of very simple example of how that works. And in order to f figure out that markup, we would, once track and trace is in place, we would have access to basically um, uh, all state data uh, to determine what that average markup price is. Currently, we're doing it by um, sampling individual retailers, but it's hard, it was hard uh, after just a few months to get a sufficient data set to be able to um, adjust that statewide rate. So then, so then following that, if, let's just say, I mean, it sounds like you're taking a somewhat conservative approach to establishing that 60%, but yes. once track and trace is in place, let's just say that you're, you know, overestimating that, uh, that, that 60% and it's closer to 40, let's just pretend. Are you, would you contemplate, uh, you know, reimbursements or credits back uh, for, for that? Well, it happens every six months. So for this period, it is it is sixty percent. We would not go back and, and offer credits. And if anything, I think we're being at the moment conservative in what the actual markup um, 
percentage is. We're mindful of the impact on the market. But it, to one of the earlier comments that was made that, you know, that could we just adjust the markup percentage to effectively lower the tax rate? I, the idea of the markup percentage was to, as closely as we can with statistical validity, approximate the actual sales price. So I don't think that we would view that as our role to um, actually try to have a backdoor impact on the tax rate. So then, sorry, just so then following that, uh, you know, you've got throughout the state, I think, a variety of, of solutions, taxing solutions that aren't just in the sales tax vein, right? So local jurisdictions, some will go through a sales tax, others are contemplating things like developer impact fees, uh, you know, structure taxes, square foot, you know, uh, uh, fees, um, uh, and even creating uh, community finance districts, right? And so everybody's kind of trying to figure this out, but that ultimately doesn't matter what, you know, mechanism you use, you're rolling that back to, you know, the, the, the folks doing the distribution or sale. Um, and so the, so the fees that they're going to be assuming will dictate their ultimate sales price, right? Um, and so some jurisdictions are going to be much higher because they're applying a lot more fees um, and, uh, and, and all to the distributor or the storefront, um, and others aren't. Uh, and so how do, you, how do you take into account for that if you're, uh, if you're creating that 60% you know, markup or whatever? Because you know, some may be a lot higher, some may be a lot lower, and, and so you're applying one, one number to you know, the entire state. Again, we're, we're looking at um, valid statistical sampling, which will have a, a much, once track and trace is fully operational and online, we'll have a much better um, view into that. But my sense from talking to many in the industry and from uh, looking at data from distributors is that y you might not see as much variation as you would expect given those... Um, given those local differences. But, but if you, if, let's just pretend we do see that. Um, would We're you still responsible for coming up with a statewide rate statewide. under the so law. So you wouldn't have a tiered structure based on? We wouldn't. No. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, here, here's my dilemma. Um, I hear the, uh, in the public comment, the idea that um, buying the legal marijuana is uh, twice as expensive, for example, as what you can buy on the street. And the, uh, one of the easy ways to, um, to attack that or try to change that is talking about the tax structure. But I have no idea what really goes into making the legal product twice as expensive as what you get on, get on the street. Is it, how much of that is due to the lack of um, ability to, um, to deduct expenses? How much of that is due to um, the fee structure? How much of that is due to um, the excise tax and, and, and the sales tax? And how much of that is just plain due to the, the markup that's being done? And if I don't know, if I don't have a way of of being able to have at least reliable estimates of the different factors that go into that doubling of the price, um, I'm not in a good position to be saying this is what we should or shouldn't do around the taxation. Without that information, we're flying blind. So how do we get that information? Well, our, the tax rates are the clearest part of that calculation. The others are much harder to mention. I mean, one thing I would say, which I, I mentioned in my remarks, I, I think we have barely begun, and, and I, I think CDTFA has actually done more than others, but we've barely begun to do enforcement. So I, I think you've got businesses operating around the state, and it seems to be, there seems to be more noncompliance at least anecdotally in Southern California than in Northern California, uh, very openly without the necessary permits. And that seems to me a recipe for, for 
problems. Um, so, you know, the, it, it, I could see that it would be very hard to compete against uh, a business that looks perfectly legitimate and is advertising and, you know, has billboards and yet has no permit. Um, I, I, I have sympathy for those, for those retailers. I, you know, we, doesn't mean we, we can collect less in tax than is due, but I think we owe it to the state to make a real effort to enforce, um, to make sure people are in compliance. Uh, Thank you uh, for being here. Uh, just a question. If, I believe the first quarter revenue generated was lower than anticipated, right? That's right. Um, so is there thinking about what are the barriers and what are maybe some of the motivating causes for that? Um, because clearly we have to, you know, fund the Bureau, which is essential. We have to um, be able to fund um, the enforcement. And so I'm just wondering, um, you know, what is your thinking on what might be the biggest barriers to that? And then what is um, maybe anticipated uh, for the second quarter? Well, we'll have second quarter um, data relatively soon. Uh, and um, I expect that it will be higher than the first quarter, but we'll We'll have to see how that, how that works out. I think there's clearly some confusion in the market. So there are people who want to comply who maybe are not complying perfectly. Uh, I think that's part of it. But I think that there is, you have a very openly operating sector of the market that's not in compliance. And um, again, our revenue estimates were predicated on compliance. So that's how we do all of our revenue estimates. And if compliance is lower than expected, then revenues will be lower than expected. And I think that's what you're seeing. I'd, and, I'd like to ask a question about the wet plant tax or the fresh plant mm -hmm. tax at $1.29 an ounce. So, um, Many cultivators, like with that fresh plant tax, it assumes, I think, that you're going to harvest an entire plant, right? But many cultivators will harvest in phases. So, like, my question is, and I haven't been able to quite get an answer for cultivators asking, is if you cut a fresh plant and apply the, the fresh plant tax of $1.29 an ounce and then choose to take a portion of that plant material into the manufacturing sector, and then choose to dry a portion of that plant material for a dried harvest, can that $1.29 fresh plant tax cover everything that you've harvested? Mm, no. <laughs> uh, I, I, if, you're, if you're selling that portion as dried, I mean, you, you wouldn't be able to cut off the entire thing, save the flowers, which are taxed at nine and a quarter, and then dry it and have it already taxed at a dollar. I mean, that wouldn't, so that wouldn't as a work. cultivator, can I harvest my tops, bring them into my dry room, dry and cure them, sell them as a dry flower tax, and then harvest the remainder of the plant later on to, at I, a wet plant tax? I believe that would be allowed. I'd have to confirm that with the tax experts, but I believe that the portion that, if, if you're selling it, um, the fresh portion is weighed within two hours of, of uh, cultivation that, or of, of harvest. That portion is taxed separately. The other portion you could save and dry and it would be taxed as, as it enters the stream of commerce. And then in that wet plant tax, you're taxed on all of the waste material. So, um, I just am I'm curious how, I mean, you had mentioned earlier that there were challenges in trying to understand or determine how much cannabis, whether it's dried flower or dried leaf, say, goes into a manufactured product. But as a cultivator, when I harvest a wet plant to take to a manufacturer and I weigh it within the two hours of harvest, I'm not allowed to take any mold out, I'm not allowed to destem it, I'm, I'm paying for all of what is going to go into either my waste as the cultivator or the manufacturing waste. I'm 
Just, I'm kind of curious I, about why and how that decision I, came about. I, I'm, not, I'm not certain. I, I can't speak to that. I can get you more information. I have heard, I mean, as I've traveled around the state and talked with growers, I've, I've received feedback that they think the fresh rate that we established is, is fair. If, if people think otherwise or there are issues, I'm, I'm happy to have the team take a look at them. Thank you. Okay, any others? All right, seeing none, thank you so much for Thank you for having me. Filling us in, appreciate that. All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and open public comment on the presentation we just received. Did you say that was on the presentation we just received? Oh. Speaker one, go ahead. Hi, Paul Hansbury. Uh, a few things. Um, I'm told by the retailers that the excise tax, the way that he broke it down, if it was $100, it would be 60%, so it's $160, and there's 15% of that. I'm told by retailers that they first add on the sales tax and then the excise tax on top of that. Yes, you tax the tax. Secondly, on um, uh, Committee Member Nevidal's question, the, she asked about the cultivation tax for compassion programs. Uh, and the answer was that um, the cultivation tax is, is uh, paid um, once it enters the marketplace. Well, the excise tax is paid when the retailer pays it, and then it's refunded after it's taken out of the marketplace. So the cultivation tax should also be refunded to the cultivator uh, once it's taken out of the marketplace. S to speaking to the, the, um, the other cultivation tax about the fresh and the dried, there are three different tiers now. One for trimmed flowers, one for shake, and one for fresh. A lot of manufacturers use untrimmed flowers. Now they're saying that, that, that if you have an untrimmed flower, that's the same price as a trimmed flower. That just doesn't seem fair. As far as other taxes now, there's barriers to entry. There's a lot of people that can't comply because of these barriers, and they can't pay their taxes if they don't have a license. You're talking about enforcement for people that can't get in because it, everything is either too expensive or too onerous. It's not just the cultivators. It's not just the operators. This document is in your packet here. If you look at page two and three, on page three, there's a copy of, of checks that one of the business operators uh, allowed me to share. Her business, she gave me the taxes for the BOE for her business, not, not a cannabis business. I'm uh, sorry. $30,000 difference between 2017 and 2018 attributed to... to um, sorry, your, I'm sorry, your time, time is time up. Time's up. Thank you. You can mute it. Thank you. Speaker two. Good afternoon. William Perno. with a question on taxation for uh, the proposed rule to make um, vehicle deliveries in any municipality. Uh, right now we know that two-thirds of cities are in the state aren't participating in marijuana um, sales within their jurisdictions there. But we know other cities are allowing unlimited cultivation of marijuana within their cities with the intent to export that excess crop outside of their city to other cities. So my question is, is that an unintended consequence if this rule takes effect to allow marijuana vehicle deliveries into any city in California or any county with a um, licensed a permitted business, is that going to pit city against city? when it comes to the taxes, who gets the tax then? Because right now we know that the cities have to participate, at least have a testing lab to be able to get some of those tax monies that are being drawn. But is this unintended consequence going to be that you're going to see cities that are going to be exporting their marijuana into another city that may not want it there, being delivered by a vehicle, and then the tax money that's being collected, perhaps there's some state tax money there, but the other larger taxes are going back to that originating city that allowed the cultivation or they're going there. So I just want to make sure that as you look at this rulemaking process here, that you take into consideration the impacts that might be in the tipping point that could bring on some of these cities. They're already under a huge pressure uh, 
for either um, a ballot initiative through a citizen signature gathering process, a citizen's initiative, or placing a ballot measure on, the, on themselves because of the fear that the industry will write that um, ballot measure and that's what they'll be stuck with. And then if we have the vehicle deliveries on top of that without any taxation coming, is that going to have cities pause now and say, if we want to get that tax money for that vehicle delivery that you're going to allow into any city, we have to allow marijuana in our city where that may not be their intent. So that's just my hope is that you'll look at that as part of your research and maybe have a study or a finding or some type of report on what that consequence could be to those cities. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Speaker three. Hi, my name is Joseph Aroni. I am the founder and director of the Sweet Leaf Collective. Uh, we're the oldest continuously operating medical marijuana group in the state. We provide free cannabis to low-income, terminally ill patients since 1996. So I just want to thank everybody for bringing up compassion. Um, this is definitely a very important issue that we haven't really solved yet. Um, our patient's health is declining. I'm really happy to hear that uh, the CDTFA has taken a firm stance that compassion is not uh, required to pay excise tax. Um, I wanted some clarification about do compassion operators need recognition from the BCC to qualify for this excise tax exemption. Um, I'm assuming that since compassion is also medical that sales tax does not qualify. One thing that was not addressed is use tax, which might be something to consider. Um, and then of course the cultivation tax, uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Nevidal about bringing that up. Um, I'm still not sure if that's statutory or if that can be dealt with with the BCC. That is another very big issue. Uh, we gave away over 100 pounds of cannabis last year and we have been told uh, this year that we would be required to pay something between 50 and $200,000 in taxes. Um, this is for a small nonprofit with you know three people involved, now just one person involved myself, but um, it sounds like with that excise tax, that'll take a big chunk of that amount out. But yeah, there's still the issue of taxes in regards to compassion. And again, I want to thank you all for working towards a positive solution for this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Speaker one. Hello again. Um, in relation to um, operating under the current regulations, um, what taxes are nursery responsible for? Uh, the tax and clones um, issue has been confusing, and would it be possible to get uh, CDTFA to clarify since they are here? Thank you. Thank you. Speaker two. Thank you. Susan Tibben. Um, speaking uh, about the uh, comprehensive um, presentation about taxes, and speaking about unintended consequences, um, one of the previous speakers mentioned two tax forms, one for 2017, one for 2018, and they are absolutely apocryphal. This is a small town in Northern California. It's Laytonville. We're looking at businesses that are not cannabis-based. The market is losing, the, the food market with an Ace Hardware is losing almost a million dollars a month. The 40-year-old nursery is down 75%. The gas station, which stood to benefit from our bypass from Willits, is down 11%. So what I'm getting at here is the taxes, while needed by municipalities, um, it seems to me it might be a better idea to make them more realistic and lower the barriers to entry for small home businesses Granted, they would be paying, we would be paying a much lower tax than a, a giant corporation in the valley. Um, but you're also preserving our communities, and that's where I'm going in terms of unintended consequences. The man who spoke earlier with the beautiful red crocheted hat um, is right on the money. Um, we are facing a disaster which has already started, and we all can work together to do the right thing and not make this worse. Uh, or we can look at financial disaster in a lot of the small towns and the federal government we have now is certainly not gonna step in to help us. It's gonna fall upon the counties. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and take a quick break for lunch. I'd like everybody to get back here at uh, 1.30 if we could. Thanks so much. like we are back and we have uh, maintained a quorum for the uh, remainder of the meeting. The um, next item we have on the, uh, the list here this uh, afternoon is a public item or a public comment on items not listed on the agenda. Um, just for a guidance here, uh, go ahead and queue up as we've been doing. Uh, committee may not discuss or take action on any matter raised during the public comment section that is not included on this agenda, except whether to decide to place the matter on the agenda of a future meeting. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and uh, start the uh, general public comment, please. Hi, Paul Hansbury, Mendocino County. Um, I'm pretty sure that all of you have this document in your packet. Um, it speaks a little bit to the, uh, the damage report. There's some um, statistics here for, for, from the community, different damages since January 1st. And the last five pages speaks to a home business license. Um, I would like to propose that perhaps at the next meeting, we could agendize discussing this. I would be happy to give a demonstration point by point or a presentation point by point so that we could discuss this because we believe that it's something that really needs to happen for the small farmer. Um, it, it is a first draft and um, perhaps there's some things that need to be legislated, but I think that most of it can be regulated and create a new license. And I would like to uh, uh, I have a copy here for anyone who doesn't have it. I've got 25 copies here, and anyone that wants uh, a copy, they can email me at lovingly.legally at gmail.com, and I will send them a copy of it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Speaker two. <coughs> Excuse me. Good afternoon. Susan Tibben. Proposition 64 promotes both in language and spirit local decision making, local site specific security, and the recognition that Los Angeles, Visalia, Mendocino, San Francisco, Eureka are very, very different from each other and unique in their needs. They deserve region and site specific oversight. Home businesses capitalized at approximately $50,000 that's the, the capitalization for most small home businesses in the United States as of 2017. They represent the largest cohort of businesses in the country. Let's keep that going in California. Home businesses are conducted in the home. It's no more inconvenient for local home business inspection than it's uh, inconvenient for utilities or Viacom cable to enter one's home by appointment. It's not just inconvenient for a small home business to rent a non-existent commercial space or build a separate space. It's logistically and financially impossible. But please, let's not ignore the elephant in the room. Sean Parker financed the best initiative money could buy to the tune of $10 million. The state seems to have chosen, either by omission or commission, to tacitly corroborate Mr. Parker's comment, which was, if I may paraphrase, that small farmers to, could dig up their million dollars buried in the backyard and bring that to the table if they wanted in. <laughs> he was and he is wrong. He wasn't even born when our parents and grandparents started this very old but newly legalized industry. And to echo many of the speakers today, we can usher in Thank the you. financial and social disaster, or we can grant Thank you. small businesses, small business, legacy farmers licenses Thank immediately. You. Thank you. Speaker three. 
Hi, I'm William Perno, a prevention specialist here in San Diego County with the Central Region Prevention Coalition. I wanted to talk to you about your proposed uh, rulemaking for advertisement um, and the use of images or minors uh, shall not use descriptions or images of minors under 18 years of age. Uh, alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana are now legal for people 21 years of age and older. Tobacco has a master settlement where they are prohibited from using anyone under the age of 21 to advertise tobacco products. The alcohol industry has a voluntary guideline to not use models or actors that appear to be under the age of 25 years of, old, of age, but yet we see for marijuana the proposed age is 18 for a product that is 21 and older. You have an exemption in tobacco for a person under the age of 21, 18 or older with a military ID, and you have an exemption for marijuana for with a doctor recommendation for medical purposes. But we want to make sure that the um, rulemaking is taken into consideration that if you're using models who are 18 years of age, the effect that might have on youth who may look at that as another reason to go out and purchase this product. And that's why we have those prohibit, prohib, prohibitions for 21 years of age with tobacco so that we don't have youthful looking people doing that. And additionally, those um, people should look 21 or older. And right now I don't see any regulation that says you can't have a very youthful looking 18 year old uh, marketing, marketing or advertising uh, marijuana. The other thing I would encourage you to do is to look at your audience composition data for 71.6% or higher. And we're seeing sign spinners and stuff. I invite you to drive across the freeway here today before you leave the Mission Center Mall. You'll see two sign spinners out there that I saw this morning standing on the sidewalk with a sign uh, advertising marijuana 21 years of age and older. And I would ask, how do you find the audience composition data when you're standing on a street corner spinning a sign and how many youth under the age of 18 are seeing that advertisement Thank you. there? Thank you. Speaker one. Make one clarification for everyone who's speaking in public comment. You can, of course, get up and speak about anything you want. But if you're talking about the regulations that are proposed right now, I just want to make sure you understand that this is not a formal regulation hearing. So if you want that information to be considered part of the formal process, you'll either need to come to one of our um, regulation hearings or submit it in writing to the Bureau during the 45-day comment period. Thank you. Okay. Speaker one. Hi, Anna Foster here. Um, I come today representing Mendocino County. Uh, in my county, most farmers are small craft producers cultivating anywhere from 25 plants up to the local limit of 10,000 square feet and only pulling one harvest a year for most. And they face many barriers to entry, one being um, cost that I mentioned earlier. Um, another <clears throat> important issue for small farmers is that um, a lot of them are cultivating in both hoop houses and outdoors and using zero watts and um, there's still a license being required for, or there's a requirement for two separate licenses for full sun cultivation and that just seems very unnecessary. And um, another point I'd like to make is small farmers um, must have an outlet for direct sales without being required to do the three of the four micro businesses. Um, as those farmers cannot do farm to table events or have local farmers markets without needing other expensive licenses. This also affects Mendocino County tremendously as we are a region whose prime economic industry is cannabis. And this also impacts our ability to bring tourism to the region, which is an opportunity that we desperately need. And uh, lastly, I just want to say that um, uh, cottage farmers having more than one cottage license are not allowed to participate in uh, cooperatives and uh, f farmer cooperatives are a traditional way that small ag farmers thrive and survive. And so there needs to be more options and inclusions for cooperative development, particularly uh, for the small farmer. And um, in terms of um, uh, inspections, um, I'm, there's a concern that um, of, of farmers being penalized if not able to grant entry to farms and um, in rural Egypt regions <clears throat> there's more logistic plannings that needs to happen um, as most gates are locked access to points and owners are always on site thank you <coughs> thank you speaker two uh, yes my name is Joshua Jenkins chief executive officer of Lowell Penguin Incorporated um, I'd like to suggest that the handling of public affairs be added to the next agenda to be afforded fair process. So 
obviously there is maybe some expectations that need to be leveled with how the BCC handles the matters with the public. Um, my business in particular has drawn attention to equity treatment, statutory equity treatment already in the books in the form of Business and Professions Code Section 16102. I've brought attention to the attorneys of the Bureau of Cannabis Control, and I've brought attention at multiple points, specifically after the last meeting in which the Bureau of Cannabis Control Advisory Committee approved the review of fees associated with better owned startups unanimously. And then I was ignored by those attorneys after I was given a blanket answer of we're not going to follow it. I will not be ignored. The veteran community will not be ignored. We will get louder and louder until somebody understands what we are going through. And the treatment of the people, that's why these people are getting angry. It's because they feel disrespected, disrespected by individuals on this committee, disrespected by attorneys outside of this, the view and the scope of this committee. They feel disrespected because they don't feel that fair process is being afforded. Additionally, the equity, that's exactly what happened in LA when the lights went off. And was that tabled for another discussion so we can actually get a full discussion on the equity and address the problems associated with it? No, we didn't. It was the lights went out, we turned them back on, we stayed all day, and then we listened to them. But we didn't listen to them because we haven't done anything to actually advance the equity. We need an agenda item set so that the public can understand what is the level of expectation that we are to expect out of this committee and additionally out of the Bureau of Cannabis Control. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Speaker three. Hi, I'm Joseph Aroni from the Sweet Leaf Collective Compassion Program providing free cannabis to low income terminally ill patients. Um, so this time last year we had legally given away over 60 pounds of free cannabis. This year, through the new regulated framework, we have legally given away 10 pounds. This is directly impacting the lives of those most vulnerable in our communities. This is a big issue. Um, there was something in the new regulations that dropped, I know I need to resubmit this, but um, in regards to local delivery, and I'm wondering if, since that was non-statutory, if there are other things in regards to compassion that would be non-statutory that we can address through regulations. Um, we have recently expanded to Los Angeles and we're taking care of more people but we are providing them with less medicine. That is an issue. Uh, we are also currently looking for cultivators and manufacturers to co-brand with. Uh, we've found a number of them. Now say, for example, they donate 20% of their proceeds, uh, goes towards compassion. Can this be deducted from their taxes? I'm not sure if that's uh, something for the CDTFA. Um, also, we do have SB 829 in Sacramento currently to address uh, the cultivation tax and possibly create the new compassion license type. Uh, I would encourage uh, the panel here to again address the non-commercial compassion license type because in LA it was voted unanimously with all of y'all here to do it. And I thought that was going to be great, but then found out later that this is an advisory board. And so that suggestion wasn't necessarily going to actually happen. So I would really like to see that happen. And so with the thank, low income thank patients, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexis D'Angelo. I'm the membership and outreach liaison for the California Cannabis Industry Association. Thank you for your time today. And thank you for all the hard work that you've done. On behalf of our staff, our board of directors, and over 475 businesses that we represent, we want to say thank you to Lori Ajax and the team for combining the A&M designation. It's a great job. Thank you, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Speaker two. Yes, my name is Matthew Gates. I'm an, ag I'm an agricultural worker, and I've worked with a couple of different cultivation centers in uh, uh, in the cannabis industry, and also just agriculture in general, horticulture, floriculture, things like that. Um, mostly I'd like to speak about and make public commentary on the uh, importance of regulations with regards to pesticide use and also worker safety. Uh, I myself, working in agriculture, have been exposed um, both 
uh, sometimes even maliciously and uh, non-maliciously in agricultural work, which is one of the bases for cannabis regulation, cannabis um, uh, cultivation law. And I just wanted to, I wanted to make a, uh, a suggestion that in the future, in, in, certain, in future uh, meetings, that uh, this subject become a focal point because it's important to me that for people who are buying this stuff, end users, people who are growing this stuff and cultivating it, I think it's important that workers are not poisoned in the, in the uh, cultivation of the plant. And I also think it's very important that consumers are not exposed as well because that's one of the big reasons why legalization and legitimacy were so important. One of the things that people can't get on the street is that sort of legitimacy. And I think that going forward, if we're going to make a, if we're going to support the uh, level of taxation and the other levels of barriers to entry, then people should be getting that sort of value afterwards. So uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker three. Hi, my name is Alyssa, and I am here representing a testing laboratory, and also as somebody um, who, until last year going through chemotherapy, had absolutely no idea anything about cannabis. Um, so I'd like to speak personally and also professionally regarding a public safety issue, um, and that is in regards to laboratory testing regulations, specifically batch sizes, the amount of cannabis a single sample represents. The current lot size is being 50 pounds for harvest material and 150,000 units for manufactured products, which is substantially larger than the 10 pound size California started with, and the 5 to 10 pound lot size is regulated in other states, such as Nevada. A few ounces to represent, to represent 50, a 50 pound batch is a minuscule sampling, far too small to be safe representation of the whole. It's less than one part per pound, leaving far too much room for error, making it too easy to miss something, such as mold or harmful bacteria. Whatever the intention was in increasing the lot size so significantly is spent at the expense of accurate test results and therefore public safety. Another danger of such large lot sizes is the possible monetary pressure put on, put on testing labs to manipulate lab data with larger financial loss from each negative sample, there may be pressure put on laboratories and a financial incentive to break the rules. Please consider decreasing lot sizes to better protect medical and non-medical consumers. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker one. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dave Diopondo. I'm executive director for the Tribal Cannabis Regulatory Agency for the Ipe Nation of Santa Isabel, a Native American tribe located right here in San Diego. I also serve as executive director for the California Native American Cannabis Association, a consortium of 23 of California's 110 federally recognized tribes seeking participation in California's legal cannabis market. Uh, we, CNACA, are strong advocates of Assembly Bill 924, uh, which would give the governor authority to negotiate uh, agreements with tribes for participation in California's cannabis market. Uh, it doesn't look like the bill is going to make it to the floor for a vote, unfortunately, uh, due to uh, uh, state official reluctance to move our legislation forward. Uh, so what I would respectfully request of this committee is perhaps consider a discussion with regard to how tribes can participate uh, in the legal California cannabis market uh, under the current regulatory framework. Uh, San Isabel has two and a half years of experience in this industry. Uh, we regulate to the nth degree. Our product, the product that generates from our non-tribal uh, operators at San Isabel, pass all laboratory testing requirements of the state, uh, packaging requirements, uh, all regulatory requirements, and yet our non-tribal operators are having difficulty engaging with state regulatory agencies uh, for licensure under the current structure. Uh, so I would request that you add that to your agenda as a discussion point. Uh, we would be glad to educate the community. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker two. Hi, my name is Tom Rydeen. Um, I would like to bring up the issue of cannabidiol. I haven't heard any differentiation between the types of cannabis that are now available. Cannabidiol is a recent uh, entry into the cannabis 
phenomena and it uh, has a great significance. It can mitigate the impairing cognitive effects of THC. It, it uh, is anti-addictive to virtually every drug. So now we have uh, in hand a tool that we can use uh, if we get it to people. Um, cannabidiol also has the effect of uh, um, enzyoglysis or, or reducing anxiety. And this is a major component of mental illness. Uh, therefore, we have in hand a tool that can reduce mental illness. Furthermore, it increases serotonin levels in the brain, and serotonin uh, is the molecule uh, most directly associated with happiness. So we have a very powerful tool here, but we are not making any distinction. I, I, I agree we should continue to uh, regulate and control the high THC varieties, but when we have something that can bring what people find most important in life, happiness, and mental health, which is central to a lot of the problems we see here. We can reduce law enforcement issues. A number of states have uh, adopted um, minimal CBD levels uh, in their uh, voter initiatives and, and the laws that they enacted but I haven't heard any discussion in California about differentiating the, the types of varieties, what might be considered safe. The, the CBD project says about 4%. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Speaker one. Hi, my name is Josh Sweeter, co-founder of Infinite Chemical and Health Labs here in San Diego. We're one of the 31 licensed labs out there, and uh, I was bringing that up before. The number of labs operating in the state is small, and we all know that. And we need to be able to reach out to more customers. And one thing the, the Bureau, after the regulations came out, we're not allowed to have field offices or places we can set up around the state to just hub chain of custodies and to bring samples down. So that's one thing I think that the Bureau should really consider entering into the next set of regulations or advising with is allowing us to operate that way. I've contacted the Bureau about opening a field office and I first was told it's completely illegal. I can't do that. Contacted again and they said it's a gray area. So I don't want to live in a gray area. I want to live in a fully licensed area. And I'm trying to obey all the laws and everything with this. But with that being said, I think field offices would be a way around be able to connect the actual labs doing the work with the customers. Um, Another thing is address changing, license address changes. We, we currently are expanding in you know, license businesses. It's a big bottleneck, so we need more room. We're currently doing a 20,000 square foot build out. My, my official license should be coming in, in, uh, into effect like August. But now I'm gonna have to pay for the official license, then get my new license at the new place at the same time. So we can't just change, we're actually moving across the parking lot. But we can't move our license with it. That's something I think should be considered. If companies are being intact and staying together, we can move the license like across the street or something like that, or within the same city as long as we're meeting the credentials needed. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other uh, comments, let's go ahead and move to the uh, last item on the uh, list today, which is uh, future agenda items. I would uh, entertain any discussion from members. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, um, I think we have a pretty comprehensive package. I don't know if it would be word for word, but uh, um, I think we should uh, entertain uh, a home business license. Um, and so uh, I'd like to, I guess if it's appropriate, I'd like to make a motion that we um, entertain that to go on our agenda. Yeah. Great. We don't need a motion on that. We can just uh, go ahead and make sure that ends up as a uh, uh, presentation and discussion item for uh, our next meeting. Thank you. And, and I, you just mentioned our next meeting. I mean, I think it would be poignant if we could manage that at the next meeting because the where we're meeting, this is really important to that stakeholder. So, can I talk about item two? <laughs> um, 
We have also discussed uh, equity. Uh, there is a uh, Senate bill, I think it's 1294, uh, by um, Senator Bradford, which also discusses uh, equity. And I think we um, have not had an opportunity to fully discuss that as an item, uh, define what it means. And uh, therefore, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, add the discussion of equity uh, to our agenda. Can you repeat the bill number? Twelve ninety-four. Senate Senate Bill twelve ninety-four by Brad. It, it's not just because of him or that bill. It's uh, even in the minutes and the notes, people are discussing it, but we have not really fully um, fleshed that out yet. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Anyone else? I think that the uh, question of the home um, license is part of perhaps a, a larger issue. And the larger issue is that the um, um, Prop 64 intended to um, benefit in multiple ways uh, the small growers and the small businesses. Um, and we're still waiting, I think, for a definition from BCC of, of micro-business. And uh, so I think that that might be the larger issue of, of what recommendations can be made uh, to uh, facilitate uh, a place in the legal market uh, for small businesses and farmers, including a better definition of micro-business and the potential of this home uh, license. Amen. Mr. Chairman, can I just make a legal clarification for you? The statute actually does contain the provisions for a micro business, so the limitations and the scope of what a micro business is are actually in the statute itself. Um, I, I think that. Uh, the next meeting would be a good opportunity to address the tribal issue, and I know that, you know, that, that they're right now. It's probably going to have to look at legislation, but I think because of the area in which our meeting is going to be, tribes up there have for ten years their tribal, uh, have, their tribe has issued rules and regulations, and they've been growing cannabis, but be, because of the, the rules and regulations of the state. They've tried to comply and come in and do it correctly, and as you know, they aren't able to do it. So you have people that have made their livelihood for the past 10 years not able to compete in the market. So I think that because there's tribes up there in the north, in, in that surrounding area, this may be a good time to see how we can address this because it keeps coming up. I get calls, when are we ever going to talk about it? And I think at least if the conversation starts, it, there's a path hopefully at some point that we can look at how tribes can get into this business and not be pushed aside. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any others? Mr. Chair? Yes. yes. So I, I concur with uh, committee member Peck. I think that she brought that up at the last uh, meeting. And I just want to call the chair's attention to those items that we did call out last time as reflected on page 36 and 37 of our uh, minutes and make sure that those don't get lost in the, uh, in the queue. Because I think there's a number of things there that we've heard repeated throughout many of our meetings and I think at some point we'll need to address understanding. Obviously, we can't talk about every single one of them next meeting, but uh, we do have quite a list going as well. So just wanted to note that. All right, thank you. Anyone else? I, I, I just support Ms. Peck. All right, we all do. Thanks for that. And 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 part of uh, I think part of that discussion too needs to include you know for for any one of these uh, uh, you know legislative updates, right? Um, you know, AB nine twenty four is part of the the issue with uh, with uh, tribes and, and cannabis and.
and but you know, but it would be nice to have as we as we begin these discussions and start these presentations that you know, uh, recognizing that we're you know working uh, as an advisory capacity to the BCC, but to be able to also get you know maybe a brief update uh, on the uh, legislative activity that's going on in the background because ultimately that you know impacts uh, what we're here talking about as well. So, well, Mr. Chair, one more thing, maybe. It it goes without saying, but we have a new regulatory package on the table. It would be great if we got a summary update on that. All right, that sounds like a full day. Um, yes, there were, there were several uh, recommendations from the Public Health Youth Subcommittee that, for purposes of time limitation, didn't get presented. So I would like an opportunity to present those. And second, secondly, uh, with the new permanent regulations that are put out is are the subcommittees going to be reenacted reactivated to be uh, looking at the permanent uh, regulations and and is uh, when will we as a advisory board have an opportunity to discuss the permanent regulations just let me for legal purposes let me clarify you can certainly discuss whether or not that should be a goal on a future agenda but you can't actually discuss um, that topic because it's not agendized but you can decide whether or not you want to Put that topic on another agenda, but the details of how to proceed aren't agendized for today. Can I ask a question though? Um, just like procedurally, because there's those hearings where you're taking public comment, I, I feel like there was some question as to what could be presented in this type of body and discuss. So, is it possible? Can we on the future agenda have an update on the permanent regulations and input on them? Um, it would depend on how you want to go about Obviously, the public comment period is open, and anyone can comment um, <clears throat> about whether or not they, with, what they see in the, in the permanent regs. If the board, the I'm sorry, committee wants to decide to discuss regulations on a future agenda, they can do that, but you can't really discuss that now. Um, you can only talk about whether or not you want to put it on a future agenda because of, because of Bagley Keene. Yeah, I don't think you're talking about discussing it now. I think you were. No, but I thought there was some issue with whether we put it on the agenda for today, because that was something that I thought had come up, whether we would discuss, get an update on the proposed permanent regulations, have a discussion today, and there was some issue with it. But perhaps I was mistaken. Just a point of clarification. We'd need to have a special meeting, would we not? Because we would not meet the 45-day comment period if we waited till our next regularly scheduled meeting in Humboldt. The comment period ends August 27th. The formal comment period does, yeah. Okay. Well, excuse me, but there seems to be something wrong here. Uh, as the advisory committee for things to be set up in such a way that our next meeting is after the public comment period, then we're sort of aced out of the advising role. <laughs> I'm, I'm not really eager to have an extra meeting, but um, how can we serve our purpose without one? I think the rec your recommendations were actually done before the re regs came out, so a lot of that was considered by all the licensing authorities as we were going through the process. Um, you did have meetings set on a certain schedule, but of course, you know, the chair has the ability to set another meeting if chooses or the committee as a whole. Um, but for today, you just have to talk about whether or not you want something on a future agenda items because you can't talk about the specifics if it's not on your agenda. <laughs> well, but. I guess you know I was I was talking a little bit about this earlier today and and uh, I, I I tend to agree with you, Dr. Cermak, that you know I, I, one of the things I'd like to see on a future agenda of ours is trying to maybe get a little bit more clarity as we're going through these growing pains of what the role and responsibility of the committee is um, because I think we need to um, to help understand what that specifically our our role is and. You know, there's there's some concerns I think that have been expressed to me. You know, my my uh, representation here, we all come with a different background, different organization that we represent. Um, and mine is, you know, 
uh, directed in local government and public safety predominantly. Um, and so as things roll out from the, the Bureau, you know, I get a tremendous amount of <laughs> contact from, you know, colleagues up and down the state. Um, and, uh, you know, it, look, we, we set these uh, meetings to be every other month. Um, and, uh, and then the process as it unfolds with the regulatory uh, side of the Bureau is, is independent of our, you know, meeting schedule. It just occurs as their process unfolds. And, you know, we're, I think there's a bit of a challenge in trying to align, you know, the efficiency of the Bureau with the uh, uh, proposed meeting schedule. So I, 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 you know, I wouldn't be opposed to uh, seeing if we couldn't um, uh, uh, host another meeting um, in the August time frame so that the uh, committee is able to address uh, during the public comment period um, those, uh, those regulations. I just want to clarify, as I mentioned today, that the advisory committee hearings, so those are not formal regulatory hearings. We have formal regulatory hearings that we have to have under the process. So in terms of public comment, anyone who wants to make comment, um, just doing it at the advisory committee meeting would not meet, would not fall under the APA process. You need to, to take the step to either attend one of those hearings or send something in writing. If the committee... <laughs> I just so then why are we here um, <laughs> because you know I, I don't want to make too fine a point on this but you know if we're here as an advisory capacity and then you know as as a member of, of you know my city and the, the groups that I represent then are we then required to resubmit my comments in the normal regulatory process and you know work with other groups that we all represent and submit that separately or are we using this opportunity in these hearings I understand it's not directly regulatory but we were established as a member of 22 individuals from around the state representing different uh, uh, perspectives on this and if what we're saying here today or any of the comments that we've had in the past aren't part of the public record in the regulatory process then then what are we doing The formal regulatory process has very specific requirements that we have to follow. I think we had all those subcommittee meetings so that your comments would have came in before that public comment period and um, were considered by the licensing authorities prior to issuing those proposed regulations. So those have been considered um, by the different licensing authorities already in um, preparing them. For something, though, to be on in the formal record of the comment period, for example, for um, the public, if they were to get up and speak at an advisory committee meeting, that's not a formal regulatory hearing, so we would need them to understand that they're sharing important thoughts, but for it to be considered part of the regulatory process, you, you need to either submit it in writing or be a, attend one of those hearings so that we can follow the APA process. Well, but I guess, you know, and again, I, you know, maybe this is something that we can, uh, you know, also discuss offline because if, if what we're saying here isn't a formal submittal to the regulatory process through APA, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I think we're all busy um, and we come here and, and we travel around the state and we, we go to these meetings and, and I guess maybe I was under the assumption that you know, the messages and the information we would carry forward would at some point be part of that formal regulatory process. So what, what do we need to do? And I, and, and I recognize this is all new. This is a new process for all of us, and, and we're going to have a bit of a growing pains in this. But, but what do we need to do to ensure that, that the collective discussion that we have with all of these experts around the table is integrated into that very formal regulatory process so that you know I don't have to go back to a meeting in Sacramento to then formally submit my comments or my concerns uh, into the into the record right I understand um, the Administrative Procedures Act allows for a specific comment period and specific submittals for that comment period we do consider everything we get that comes into the Bureau it's just different if it comes in through the formal process we have certain requirements in terms of the um, regulatory process on how we have to respond to it um, I don't think we can get for any further than we right now just kind of talking a little about what you can put on your future agenda items because that's what this agenda item is right now um, but it is definitely 
um, something to just be conscious of, like I mentioned to the people earlier today, that the, the comment period has specific hearings for the very specific purpose of submitting those regulations. I understand that you uh, took our recommendations into consideration in coming up with the permanent uh, rec regulations. Uh, there were some changes that are made from the temporary to the uh, permanent uh, regulations. And um, if two, two months from today, if we met and discussed, put on the agenda today, and discussed in particular the changes that were made in the permanent uh, regulations, would our advice, our cumulative advice, be taken into consideration by um, the Bureau of Cannabis Control in terms of the final permanent uh, regulations? We can't get into a discussion of that today. We can talk about what you can put on future agenda items. Um, because that's what's agendized for today. Obviously, we do have a comment period, and there are certain requirements for that. Um, certainly, the Bureau looks at anything. I was just day. asking for a point of clarification, and I do believe you can make that clarification today. Yes, we have a question. Well, yeah, I make a motion that we skip, try to schedule a meeting between now and the end of the comment period, and that from that meeting, we make a recommendation as a board in writing, uh, just like anybody else would do through the formal process. And if we can, if we can come to an agreement, we make a formal recommendation because they're, they're absolutely correct. They're bound by time periods mm -hmm. that they have to respond to every formal comment in that period within a certain amount of time that reopens the window for a period of time for people to comment on their responses to that. So they are tied to this. So the, if we want to do this as a, a uh, advisory committee, the only way we can do it is to have a meeting in advance, and I think we can do it as an entity if we write a letter formally saying this is what this committee wants to have in, I think. The committee can act as a whole, um, like you did with your other recommendations. Um, in terms of the motion, though, you don't really have an, anything on the agenda to vote on <laughs> meetings or what, but uh, your chair does have the ability to set the agenda and has the ability to set a meeting. Um, if he so chooses under your bylaws. Oh, I'll go ahead and so choose. Um, let's, uh, let's make sure that uh, we work closely with uh, myself and Tamar as the uh, co-chair to establish a, a, a meeting um, before the end of the public comment period in August. So we'll, we'll definitely make that commitment to everyone. Um, and, uh, you know, location to and, and date and time and so forth to be determined. So. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to comment. The last time that we wanted to do this, um, we didn't have the meeting. And so I, I don't like the word, even though it's not a motion, try. I think that you know we are making a recommendation to the chairman that we want to have this meeting because it's been clearly stated that why are we here? And I think that um, Mr. Jenkins even, well, I, I'm sorry, I can't comment what he said. But I think that it's, that it's been said this afternoon that we need to know what our expectations are and what our, I, we, I thought I understood our role, but I'm, I'm questioning now, how do we advise after everything has already come back to the state? So I, I really encourage you to please do it. Yeah, no, understood. And, and just just to let you know, I mean, the, the last time we went through this process and, and setting any agenda is, you know, we have a lot on our list. Uh, we have a limited amount of time. Um, and the logistics involved in, in, you know, what we tried to do last time, uh, finding a location and so forth, it put a significant burden on staff and um, trying to establish a quorum as well. Don't forget that's part of our requirement. As we went through that process and started to reach out, we could not effectively do that. So as much as, you know, the emphasis is on, on myself and Tamar and staff to do this, the emphasis is on, on you all as well to be as flexible as possible and responsive as possible to let us know as soon as possible because if we can't establish those dates and publicly notice, we cannot have a meeting. And so that was part of the trouble with the, uh, the last go around with this. So as soon as we leave here, we'll start working with staff to see what we can do, but we need you all to, uh, to help. Thank you. So I have a question about whether if this advisory committee meets separately from the posted um, uh, public hearings with regard to the permanent regulations, is the Bureau able to take that advice 
and integrate it um, in the same way as the public uh, response well, uh, and testimony that's during of, those periods? I think that's kind of what we were talking about earlier. We can't have that discussion today, um, but we need to be able to put that on that agenda for August and in that agenda item um, be able to identify a mechanism that, that ensures that the comments and discussion that we have at that August meeting somehow finds its way into the formal regulatory hearing process. I can tell you that the Bureau is not prohibited from considering things that come into them, but there are different requirements when it's an official comment in, a, in the official part of the regs, but we can't really get into how you're going to do that if that's what you want to do or whatnot today because of, of the agenda. What about doing a, um, a, organizing some sort of a joint hearing with the Bureau so that we not only get stakeholder input. I think we're getting a little far afield from future agenda items, unfortunately. No, I think we've got our marching orders for, for what we need to do in, in August. I think it's, we've got a fairly robust and if not ch tangential conversation on this. Um, so we understand what needs to be done, and, and we'll definitely be working with uh, uh, myself, Tamara, and, and staff to try and uh, uh, ensure that we meet everyone's expectations. All right. Any others? No? All right. Well, I would uh, take a motion to adjourn the meeting then. Order, 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 order. I don't think we ever voted on the minutes. We did. We did not. We're, we're, we will be addressing that at the next meeting. Oh. We tabled it. We oh, tabled. the table. They were tabled. Thank you. Miss uh, oh, All right, so there's a little bit of a discrepancy. I'm not confident that we uh, necessarily have. Uh, we'll, clarify this later uh, under the uh, state rules, but uh, typically uh, public comments on future agenda items and discussion isn't typically uh, uh, an opportunity, but seeing that you guys are engaged and wanting to make sure we're as uh, transparent and as open as possible, if we could uh, go ahead and have one more uh, public comment uh, period, please. Thank you. Go ahead, speaker one. Hi, uh, regarding the micro business uh, versus the home business license, um, um, Ms. Colson uh, said that it is specified in statute. It's the way the Bureau has interpreted it as a micro business. It's not micro. There, it's unlimited manufacturing, unlimited um, uh, distribution, and unlimited retail. There's nothing micro about that. That does not help the small farmer. That's why the necessity for a home business license. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker number two. Hello. Joshua Jenkins, Lowell Penguin. I would like to make recommendations. Uh, I'm for sorry. Future I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Can we have the time reset? Thank you. I'm sorry. Begin. Yeah. Joshua Jenkins, Lowell Penguin Incorporated. I would like to make a recommendation from the public as regards to future agenda items to be discussed and hopefully recommended. Um, first, an update to all the recommendations passed by this advisory committee and the results of that recommendation. Whether it was ignored, whether it was passed, whether what adaptations to the regulations were made based on the advisory committee's passage of that. Next, equity. Equity including the statutory equity treatment already afforded to the veteran community in regards to Business and Professions Code Section 16102. That specifically needs to be an agenda item as to why the statutory relief already provided is not being followed by the Bureau of Cannabis Control and why the community at large is being ignored. I have 12 partners, a part of the Veteran Alliance for Government Accountability, and all of us have been ignored by this Bureau's attorneys. Not acceptable. Fair process and expectations of the advisory committee, and additionally, the Bureau of Cannabis Control's role for the people, so that the people can understand what fair process looks like, so they can understand why, and being transparent, understand the process of where they need to be, so they don't waste their time. And then, based on, obviously, discussions that have happened today, a better 
clarification and de a definition of the roles and responsibilities of this advisory committee. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Speaker three. Hi, I'm Joseph Aroni from the Sweet Leaf Collective. Um, so not to sound like a broken record, but I am part of an association with more than 30 compassion programs. We take care of thousands of Californians that are at risk. I would implore this committee to really prioritize taking care of compassion as Mr. Cermak presented to you guys at the LA committee meeting where it was voted upon as well. This is an emergency situation. Lives are on the line. Some of my patients will not be around to see the end of this when this does finally get regulated. Again, there's thousands, quite possibly tens of thousands. I just know thousands of people involved with these compassion programs whose health is deteriorating while we are all sitting here talking about this. And you as an advisory board voted unanimously on March 15th in Los Angeles to create a compassion license type. And now with the permanent regulations that have dropped, there is nothing in there in regards to compassion. And as much as I want to give you guys credit for working on this, I know this is difficult, but think about how difficult it is for me to have to talk to my patients and try to explain this situation to them. It's literally heartbreaking. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker one. Hi, I'm William Perno, and I just have a comment that I would appreciate if you have a legal update on your agenda to address um, California Health and Safety Code 11362.3 and whether that section of law is still valid. It was a very good law that was passed as part of Prop Proposition 64, took effect uh, in June of 2017, but another bill, Senate Bill 65, from last year's legislative session updated the vehicle code to make that um, marijuana and alcohol in vehicles be the same. So this is a public health and safety, particularly to um, drug to driving. The health and safety code that was part of Prop 64 made it very clear that marijuana could not be consumed in any motor vehicle. However, the update to uh, from SB 65 updated California vehicle code sections. Uh, in just a second, I'll tell you what they are. 23221 of the California vehicle code and 23225 of the California Vehicle Code. And in those sections of law, there are exceptions that allow alcohol consumption in motor vehicles. So think of your um, uh, party bus, limousine, even pedicabs with a local ordinance and stuff could have alcohol consumption. And now that um, perhaps uh, SB 65 was passed, it aligned marijuana the same as alcohol in a motor vehicle. So we now have in San Diego cannabis consumption tours, where part of that tour is marketing the consumption of marijuana in motor vehicles during these tours. And so I would just ask that the question is whether the health and safety code is still valid and can still be enforced with the update to the SB 65 that updated the California vehicle code. So we've got two different codes. Uh, SB 65 took effect on January 1st of 2018. So now we're talking about whether one superseded the other. But the net impact is it can lead to more drug driving and marijuana consumption in vehicles on our roadways, which is a danger to the public safety of everyone on our roadways. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion to adjourn the meeting by uh, Mr. Farrow. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a second. Uh, any, how much everybody just say aye. 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 All right, and we will see you in uh, wherever in whenever in August. Take care.